This is officially being recorded. Thank you very much, all of you, for being on. And feel free, any of you that are not on video yet, to add it at any point you're comfortable. It's lovely for me to be able to look people in the eyes, even if it's virtually. All right. So I'm Boaz. I work here in St. John's Health Center in Santa Monica. I work in a med surge unit. And what's the purpose for my creating and implementing this vaccine education. We all get articles a thousand times a day. You know, we, we might even have to mute the articles that we see because they're so often and they're so unnerving, quite honestly, a lot of the time. And what really, to me, became val valuable during the pandemic was not anything more than understanding how to navigate, what to understand, who to read, and it really was not ever an easy, easy, an easy answer. It didn't really matter if you were reading Fox News or you were reading CNN, because either way, you were getting sensationalist stories, which might be intended to be very, very well-meaning, but at the end of the day, it, they're still going to take a lot of things out of context. Case in point, and it happens all the time, Colin Powell. I think most or all of us know he recently died. The headlines came out from the left to the right, and most of the headlines were the same. Colin Powell, fully vaccinated, dies of COVID. Now, you got into the articles and you read, and they were talking about, oh, he also had cancer. Well, that's pretty relevant to the situation because people who have cancer fall into the 3% of the country, give or take, who don't have a proper immune system. I mean, I don't, I think most of us understand that about cancer patients, people going through chemo and so on. Now, were the articles deliberately misleading? I'm sure the vast majority of them weren't, but at the end of the day, they still were misleading to not understand that. That is just one of a thousand examples I can come up with, but my point is that I work in a hospital where people constantly want to know about COVID. They constantly want to understand the vaccines better. I know I do. And it's really hard to have to tell people all the time that you don't know the answer to the question or you hear people answering based on what their friends sent them in a text message or what they saw on Facebook. We have a responsibility as people who are healthcare providers to understand this better based on actual evidence-based knowledge and based on the research so we don't have to share the same links that people are just sending around because they're sensationalist on YouTube or Facebook or Instagram, but instead we can actually give the data. Now, doctors have been able to do this pretty darn well during the pandemic for the most part. And not surprisingly, the most vaccinated community of people in the entire country have been doctors. Back in May or June, well before there were any mandates, there were AMA already was reporting that there were 96% of doctors in the country vaccinated. Now that's about half of those are going to be very Republican, about half of those are going to be Democrats. But what they had in common was they were doctors, they're generally reading the New England Journal of Medicine, the latest research, and they're realizing, oh, regardless of politics, regardless of anything else, this makes a lot of sense to me. So when you see 96% of doctors prior to a mandate getting a vaccine, those actions speak pretty loudly to me. I had the opportunity throughout the pandemic to speak to many, more than I could count, people who were specifically not just doctors, but infectious disease specialists in various parts of the country. And certainly the bunch is about seven that work in our hospital. And I can tell you that politics of some of them seem to be different. Some of them seem to be very right, right on the right. Some of them seem to be very on the left. I can tell you that some of them are very anti the idea of mandates. Some of them are very for the idea of mandates. Some of them are not big fans of masking outdoors. Some of them think that it should still mask out indoors. There's all sorts of things that people are not on the same page about. But when it came to me talking to the infectious disease community about vaccines, they were on the same page. They were all getting them. Now, I can tell you that there were one or two uh, infectious disease physicians in our hospital who in the first two to four weeks when I was talking to them and we all finally were getting the vaccine offered in late December of 2020 that were waiting 
that didn't get it right away. And I said to them at the time, what is it that's keeping you from getting it, right? Because these are all physicians I very much respect. And they said, well, we're waiting for more data. We weren't good enough with just the trials for the original vaccines. We're waiting for more data. Most of them got it. Most, a couple of them waited. A couple of months went by, though. Those last ones came, tapped me on the shoulder and said, just so you know, we got the vaccine at the end. And I said, oh, why changed your mind? Tens of millions of pieces of data at that point. More than enough. And so I said, so how do you feel about it now? They're like, it's definitely safer to take the vaccine than not to take the vaccine. And that's a phrase you're going to hear me say during this a few times. You're not going to hear me like a snake oil salesman say, this vaccine is going to cure everything and it's 100% and there's no risk factors. That's not how it works. There's no medication or treatment or procedure or surgery in the world that's 100%. You are going to hear me talk about the risks. I'm going to be giving you numbers to different things. But what it always is going to consistently come down to is a very, very neat little fact that's going to be backed up by the numbers, which is that it is safer to get it than not to get it. And it's not even close. But we'll get to all of those numbers. So that's why we're doing this. Now, why are people on this, on this lecture chat in person and on teams wire people who are not part of the healthcare community because I think it's equally important for people who are not in healthcare to understand what's happening around them. And I think it's important to have, I want there to be as many different versions of myself running around who have the ability to answer people's questions because you can make a big difference to other people. I, you must all know at this point that for all the data and articles and case studies that have been out there, People at the end of the day, usually more often than not, make the decision because, oh, because these three people on my Facebook feed just did it yesterday or didn't do it. And that's how the decision ends up being made, not from talking to their doctors and certainly not from reading the research. So hopefully this will help go not even a small, but hopefully a long way towards understanding things better. And certainly I'll give time to be able to ask questions if you have any. Now, the meat and potatoes of what I'm going to talk about is going to be covering the main vaccine hesitant issues and i'm going to put it out to you guys to also tell me if you think of any which probably some will cross over things that you've heard that cause hesitancy concerns um but first i want to give a little bit of an introduction and give a little bit of science all right a basic amount of science now the thing to understand with the virus and when i look here just understand i have my notes here i just want to make sure i don't miss things and that's where i have my data and so on but i'm not reading a script in case it's not obvious so viral load matters. The load of your virus, the amount of your virus matters. It makes a different of difference. So this basic concept I can illuminate by saying, all right, so I have my my wife's Aunt Terry is on this chat. So she and I are together and let's say we're both not vaccinated and I'm walking down the street and I pass her and I am COVID infected and I'm talking and spitting into my phone and making noise and even coughing a little bit as I walk by her. We walk by each other and wave hi. Yes, she is breathing the same air that I breathe as she walks by. It's inevitable. She has to breathe some of that air, right? So she's going to have some of my infected COVID. But the reality of the situation is, as she walks by me, the amount of the virus she's going to inhale and take into her mucous membranes and her respiratory tract is not going to be enough where it actually is going to infect you, all right? This is not measles, where you're going to read right now. That's another example, by the way, of the way the media is unintentionally misleading people. The new variant is as infectious as measles. I've read that in multiple places. Well, that's very misleading because they have completely different ways that you can catch them. What that actually are trying to say, what it actually means when they compare it to measles is that each person who has this variant will basically potentially give it to an equal number of people as somebody who has measles can give it to. But it doesn't mean it's the same technique or the same ability to catch it because measles, if I was in this room and I had measles, and in a couple of hours, one of you came in this room and had a, had your lunch, you might be able to catch measles hours later after I left the room because it's an airborne aerosolized illness that just hovers around. But COVID continues, even with the new variant, to be a droplet-based illness. It's something where you come in here in 10 minutes, you're not gonna ha have any chance of breathing my air and catching COVID. Now, are there ways that COVID can be aerosolized? Yes, there are ways it can become airborne. And this 
again, has been misleading over the year, over the COVID pandemic. People will read, oh, it's airborne. It's not airborne. It's very misleading. It can become an airborne illness if something specific happens to, now picture a droplet as literally being the droplet, like there's spit. I'm talking my droplet, it comes out and with gravity, it hits the ground. Well, when you're dealing with an airborne thing, think of it more as a mist, a fine mist floating in the air. That's what it means to be aerosolized. So yeah, if I have a COVID patient downstairs and my COVID patient is getting breathing treatments, they're going to literally give them respiratory inhalers that are going to aerosolize their lungs. That room now becomes an airborne based type of, of isolation. That room now has aerosolized it. So it's not gonna just be droplet temporarily until it dissipates. We even saw a really cool case in Los Angeles uh, early in the pandemic, which freaked people out where a choir was meeting and this choir found that all of a sudden there was transmission, but they were like, wait, it didn't make sense. Why would the choir be transmitting it to each other? It didn't make sense based on thinking of them as droplets, but it actually made sense when they analyzed it and realized that the choir, the people that were hitting the high notes and they were really vibrating their lungs, they were aerosolizing the air and they were actually changing the process of it. Literally being in, an, in, in the choir was what made it more aerosolized. So there are things that can aerosolize it, but in a typical case of walking and talking and walking down the street and spending time with your friends, it is not. It is a droplet-based illness. So it's important to understand things better. Now, in the scenario where I had where Terry and I were together and we walked by each other, Terry's not gonna catch COVID from me because there's just not enough infectious virus for her to catch as she walks by, outdoors no less. Now let's take a case where Terry and I are indoors and we're in a room and the windows are closed and there's it's not a particularly well ventilated space and our masks are off and I still have COVID. Well now you can bet your, bet your butt that Terry is going to be breathing the same air over and over and over and over again from me, right? So she's now inhaling my virus, but she's inhaling more virus and inhaling more virus the viral load matters. And at a certain point, her body is gonna succumb and say, all right, I'm infected. Now that amount could be this amount of minutes or this amount of minutes, and it, but the important point is it's going to happen at some point. Now what made Delta a game changer is that when Delta came along, first they were worried about, is it going to be more severe? Is it going to be more likely to kill you if you get it? Seems like not really, not really a huge difference in that. But then we saw the other aspect of it, which was, is it just as infectious? Is it just as easy to catch? And the answer to that is it is actually more infectious. So Delta became a game changer because the amount of viral load you needed in order to be able to catch it was a lot less. So let's say now Terry and I are together and sitting indoors, instead of her catching COVID from me after seven minutes, let's just say, now with Delta, it might've been two, three minutes. So it just, took less virus at that point to catch it. So viral load matters. Now, Omicron, Omicron or Omicron, I hear it pronounced over and over again, both ways. So Omicron, Omicron, what we know about it, because there's a lot we're still waiting to determine. There's a lot of preliminary data. Most of it is out of South Africa where it started, but we can't necessarily assume it'll be the same here because it's a different population with different, with different amounts of vaccine, but, what we're seeing so far, which is very promising for people who are vaccinated and even more promising for people who are boosted, is that although it's a slippery little sucker and it gets by the defenses of the vaccine and of natural immunity far more easily, because usually we have our vaccine, which was built for the original strain of COVID, right? And then we started having different variants. So they have different mutations. This one has somewhere, I, I've, I've read different amounts, but somewhere between let's say 30 and 50 mutations on the actual spike protein. So 30 to different to 50 different mutations, there's a lot of differences. So if the goal of your antibodies originally is to, before it infects you, catch it, clutch onto that COVID particle and neutralize it, it's harder to do when there's all these other mutations and it kind of slips through which is why you're seeing more and more breakthroughs when you have variants, especially this variant. So does it mean that, oh, well, there's no point in being vaccinated if, you've, if, you, uh, if it can break through anyway? Well, this actually leads to me to my first of multiple things I'm gonna tell you, which is a common misconception about vaccines, not just COVID vaccines, vaccines in general. 
people need to understand that vaccines have two functions. We're all used to and spoiled by the one function that we just assume, which is prevent you from getting it. You're gonna just prevent it in the first place. Can't possibly get it. But that's certainly not how vaccines always work, not even just with COVID. Look at the flu shot. The flu shot year after year, people catch flu, shot, flu all the time who, haven't, who have been vaccinated as well. I got the flu a few years ago. I tested positive for influenza when I'd gotten the flu shot. But my case of the flu was about six hours of feeling really crummy, and then it basically cleared up. And my doctor said to me, if you hadn't had the flu shot, it would have been significantly worse. Not saying I would have died of the flu, I'm sure I wouldn't have, but it sure, sure as heck wouldn't have been six hours of feeling crummy and then feeling basically fine. So it's really important to understand that when we get vaccines, they are often preventing the illness, but, even when they don't, they are basically pre-medicating you. They're already equipping your body with the fight it needs to be able to make it less severe. So what you're going to hear now with Omicron very frequently is that there's going to be a ton of breakthrough infections now. A ton of people are going to be catching COVID, COVID who are vaccinated and who are boosted. But what you're going to see, first of all, is that there's going to be less from the boosted than the unboosted. You're going to be seeing less from the vaccinated without a booster than the unvaccinated. So you're going to see each degree of protection still preventing it more than it doesn't prevent it. But amongst the many of us who end up getting it, even though we're vaccinated, even though we're boosted, you're going to see that your bodies, the vaccine is still working because it actually is going to prevent it from becoming a severe illness almost all of the time. So that's the key you have to understand with vaccines is that, okay, first line of defense, it's getting through. It broke through and it didn't get prevented, right? A lot of the time you have a flu shot, it's only about 40% efficacy. That means about six out of 10 times, you're still gonna catch the flu. But remember, in those six out of the 10 of times, you're, it doesn't mean the vaccine failed you. It didn't fail me. You're, now is when your antibodies are gonna kick in and your memory cells are gonna kick in and it's gonna start the good fight against them, so it's going to lower it. So however much it fights it, it's fighting it and it's helping it. And predominantly, you're going to end up having, you're going to predominantly end up having uh, a much, much, much less severe case. So what you're going to see right now with Omicron is that people who are unvaccinated are going to have the most severe final outcomes. I'm not saying they're all going to have severe outcomes, but you're going to see more of them having severe problems. You're going to see people who are vaccinated without the booster catching it, less than the unvaccinated, but catching it, but rarely having severe outcomes. And then you're going to have people with booster, the least of all, catching it even less and having the least severe ones. The majority of people who are boosted and catching the Omicron variant are finding it to be like a common cold. People who are catching it who are not boosted yet, they seem to be having a combination of just having like an annoying case of fevers and stuff like this, but not dangerous. And people who are unvaccinated, it's like always a variety. So, and I'm going to try my best, everything I talk about, just to give you the facts and the data. I'm not trying to use scare tactics with anything here. I want the data to be able to sleep, to speak for itself. So at the end of the day, and we're going to talk more about boosters specifically later, but we are seeing that certainly boosters are being very helpful with this. Think of every time you get a dose as being more soldiers in your army. You know you have the army of soldiers trying to storm your castle of COVID. We know they're coming. They're always trying to come at us. I mean, depending on how, how much it's around us, it's somewhere, right? And right now it's everywhere. So your vaccine is basically your defense. And so you got to remember that the more you have, and we'll talk about boosters more later, I'll give you specific numbers, but the more you have with the shots, the more soldiers you have fighting them. And it actually gets even better than that because I'm actually going to teach you about how they actually become smarter soldiers too. It actually is quantity and quality that you gain from the booster. We will get to that. So can I ask a question? I'm sorry. Can I ask can something? I ask? Really? Go ahead, Mary. Um, I just said, so I have a question. Two people have COVID and one is not vaccinated and the other is, is the person without the vaccine have like a technical higher viral load in terms of, you know, when you look at it in that way right. as a viral 
Right, two people next to each other. It's a great question. I can't believe nobody's asked me this in all my previous 10 sessions or so. Okay, so two people have the virus and they're both positive and one is vaccinated, one is unvaccinated. So what we actually have seen depending on the variant, and we do not have that data yet for Omicron, okay? But depending on the one, right? In the original one, the answer was no. The person who is vaccinated has far less to give off. Then Delta came along and it looked like, you know what? They still might have a very similar amount that they can transmit. But at the end of the day, regardless of whether or not this falls in one or the other, at the end of the day, it is far, 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 far less likely for somebody who is vaccinated to be spreading it than unspreading it. But let me explain why. The person who is vaccinated and even more so the person who's booster is going to be less likely to get it in the first place. You can't give it if you don't get it. So they're already going to be less likely to give it, right? Once they get it, they'll give it though, once they have it, to your point where two people both have it and one is vaccinated, one's unvaccinated, the person who is unvaccinated will generally have a longer case of it. It will linger longer. It'll be harder to get rid of. It could be more severe. So they will have it longer and therefore they'll be able to transmit it for a longer period of time. So whereas the person who's not, who is vaccinated, generally it kicks their butt. Okay, it's a breakthrough, mild breakthrough. Maybe for a day they're contagious and it might go away and um, not be. So for between preventing it in the first place and the fact that it's a less severe case, you will end up transmitting it far less. Sure, there's a window of time where you might be just as infectious as that person. Does that make sense, that answer? Yeah, so you take a hundred, take a thousand people who are vaccinated, a thousand people unvaccinated, and they all have COVID, you're gonna have far more spread from the unvaccinated crowd for the reasons I explained. Okay, so moving on. How does the mRNA vaccine work. I'm not going to bore anybody who's not sciencey about it. We're going to give the very basics. The mRNA uses the genetic information to create the spike protein, the spike protein. So that's what they're doing. Essentially, what ends up happening is, you know how we've been able to, you know, clone sheep for a while, right, with Dolly, and we're able to gene map and so on. Well, we're also able to virus map. We're able to actually identify the code of a virus. Now, all the other vaccines we've ever had, which are amazing, they've always been one thing in common. We're giving somebody a virus. We're, you wanna vaccinate up against something, we give somebody that virus. We give them the dead virus in some cases, or we give them a live but weaker virus. But we're giving them a virus so their body can be introduced to it and say, oh, I don't want that, and they create antibodies to it. That's the goal. The thing with this, which is so novel, is you're not getting any virus when you get this. There is zero COVID given to you. What you're being given essentially is the mRNA technology developed in an amazing and innovative way to essentially take a Polaroid of exactly the virus makeup, and then they basically show it to your body. After two or three days, your body disposes of the vaccine. It's done. It's gone. It's not in your system. But by showing it to your system, your body got to see a picture of what the virus looks like. And they say, oh, that's pretty cool. And your body starts to create antibodies based on what the picture just showed them. Now, you need to understand that the mRNA never, ever, ever enters the nucleus of the cell. It's not physically possible. And that gets to another vaccine hesitant type question, which you may or may not have heard, where people try to allege that it changes your DNA. It cannot change your DNA. It is not possible because it doesn't enter the cell. So good luck trying to make it change your DNA. It won't be possible. Now, what it actually does is it causes your body to have an inflammatory reaction, right? So you have this inflammatory reaction, your body got introduced to it, and that's when you'll have your local inflammation, your arm hurts, right? That's your local inflammation happens after pretty much every vaccine. But then it'll also give you intentionally systemic inflammation, right? Your entire body is going to start having inflammation. And why is it having inflammation? Well, because it's now working its butt off to create antibodies for you. After the first dose, it's really working on the antibodies. After the second dose, it exponentially adds to the antibodies. And that's when it really gets to work on the memory cells, the memory B cells and T cells. So the germinal sensors start to create these memory cells. And this happens in your lymph nodes. So your lymph nodes can be over here. They can be over here. And that's when they start to create these memory cells and essentially it's little factories that are working to create not just antibodies but now it's creating the machines that make the antibodies they're actually creating the hardware so that in the future your body even as it starts to run lower and lower on antibodies will still have these memory cells 
so that it can still see the virus, recognize the virus, and say, ah, I think I need to create new antibodies, and it gets to create new antibodies for you, and it's pretty cool. Now, a quick little pro tip, especially for the women who are listening in the chat, this is the reason that they advised to not get a mammogram about within the first eight weeks of getting your dosage, because what happens if your germinal centers in your lymph nodes start to go to work, they swell up a little bit. What happens if you get a mammogram when this is swollen, it can be a false positive. So they actually recommend avoiding a mammogram within about eight weeks of your dosages. And I would imagine that's the case, same case for everything, for the booster and, and so on and so forth. So nice little pro tip. So the, the, the antibodies and the memory cells are, are each invaluable. And I wouldn't even necessarily say one is more important than another. I couldn't tell you which is more important. They both are very, very important. Okay. Now, this will get us into, since we're talking about mRNA, I'm going to introduce to you something that one of you might ask me, but I'm going to make this the next thing we talk about, and then I'll open it up to more to, to, to what your own, your own questions were. I'm sure a lot of you have wondered or at least heard people out loud say, how can I trust this? It's too new. We're talking about mRNA technology. It's a new technology. It, it started recently, the pandemic started, and suddenly, magically, a few months later after the pandemic, we have this brand new technology and you expect me to just take that vaccine, trusting that based on nothing, how did they do it so quickly? So here's what I need to explain to you. First of all, the mRNA technology is not as new as people often think. It did not start from the ground floor during the pandemic. It would have been a lot harder. I'm sure we wouldn't have had these if it started from the ground floor. I'm sure Johnson & Johnson would have been our first one and our golden goose for a while instead. But instead, what we had were 30 years ago, people already starting to study mRNA technology. 30 years ago. And for the last 15 years or so, there have been loads of scientists around the world studying mRNA technology. So this is not a brand new technology. It's the first one to actually come to market for this, but it's been studied for some time. Now, what you need to understand is they had already developed what they needed. So I'm gonna read you a little quote here. Moderna and Pfizer did not start from the beginning and produce vaccines in less than a year. They used the platforms they had spent many years developing and perfecting, then they just inserted the necessary piece of genetic code and completed the design for an effective mRNA vaccine. They had everything there ready to go. And let me tell you something cool. There was actually at least one place in the world, I know that Israel actually had been studying not only mRNA vaccines, but they were studying mRNA vaccines for a vaccine for coronaviruses, for chickens. They literally wanted to help come up with a vaccine for chickens that were coronaviruses. So they were already working on coronaviruses with this. It was really close. So they just stopped what they were doing and they said, oh, all right, let's plug in this new coronaviruses code into the same thing we're working on. It's not a massive modification, honestly. You know, just like every year we're able to alter the flu shot based on that flu strain or a predictive flu strain, it's not that hard once you have the mRNA technology and you're studying other things to plug in the new one. And that's what they were able to do around the world, which is really, really cool. So the first common misconception of this is too fast, how can they have developed this technology so quickly? You need to understand they didn't. It had already been around. They'd had multiple things that they were doing animal trials on. They already had one that they were doing human trials on. I believe it was Ebola virus that they were actually doing human trials on. So it's really cool. Now, that's still not going to satisfy the worry that a lot of people will have about it being new because they're going to say, okay, fine, I get it. I get it. The technology isn't as new as I thought, but still you started developing that vaccine that year and that same year by the end of the year, somehow it's already released to market. You know, we all know that drugs and vaccines take longer than that, right? They take a few years to come to market, right? Between developing them and the science of them and then testing them. So here's where I need you to understand four very basic ideas. Four things that you need to, de to develop safely a new drug or vaccine. Thing number one, you need money. 
you need lots and lots of money. It is not a cheap oper operation. So scientists around the world who are working on their cancer research and their HIV research, they're constantly doing it based on the budgets they have. And they might stop and start based on the budgets they have and how many people who can be hired for it and so on. Well, Operation Warp Speed started. Trump opened the coffers and there were blank checks written throughout the world saying, find a cure, find a vaccine. There was no money issue. There was no money challenge here. So that was no problem. Problem number one solved, and that can delay years in terms of developing something. Pro number two, number two, people, the right people. You need scientists to work on it. You need the right scientists for it. So, and if anybody's typing, I just have to warn you, I will not be able to see your chat. We'll be able to talk more audibly later. So in terms of people, well, it's true because people compete to have however many people are the right types of specialists to work on whatever the research is. And you have a limitation in terms of how many people are working on it. Well, when the pandemic hit, the earth stopped spinning and everything stopped and the money was given, please find us a cure. And people, no matter what they were working on around the world, they stopped, they paused their important research on whatever it was. And most of them came to work on a vaccine for COVID. So you had countless, countless people. I actually had somebody on my chat last week on the same class who paused me here to tell me that her cousin or uncle was actually a cancer researcher. And sure enough, he and his entire lab stopped and they started working on COVID research. And then they resumed after the vaccines. So this is a real thing. So you end up having money not as a problem and scientists not as a problem. But there's still more that's needed because once they've developed it and we can accept that they've developed it, you still have to test it. Now, I just wanna point out one quick thing just to give you a, a, a sort of crude allegory. If you have a car and your car breaks down and you have a good mechanic, you trust your mechanic, and he's genuinely going to take two weeks to fix your car. But now you have infinity number of mechanics who are all good and infinity amount of money to work on it so they could all work on it as much as they want 24-7. Is there any chance in your mind it's going to take two weeks to fix your car anymore? Because there's no chance in my mind. At this point, I think it's safe to say that they are going to be able to work on this much faster and get it done much quicker. And it's not going to therefore bypass safety mechanisms. If anything, you now have more people checking each other's work. So there's actually more people cross-checking it along the way. OK, those are the first two things. Now I mentioned there's two more things for total. This has to do with testing it, right? It's been developed. Now we have to test it. So the first thing you need when you're going to be testing, you're going to be doing trials. When you're going to do your trials, to for drugs, for vaccines, we need volunteers. So who here wants to volunteer for the Ebola virus vaccine? Anybody, anybody on this chat want to volunteer for Ebola virus vaccine? No, what about HPV? Any of you want to give us your eight-year-old daughter to test HPV on? Anybody? It's really hard to get volunteers to be guinea pigs because that's what you are. It's necessary, the world appreciates those guinea pigs, but they're the test subjects, right? And I think you can guess where I'm going with this. There was no problem with people becoming volunteers for this. The entire, <laughs> throughout the US and the world, people were like, please, please take me, test it on me. I know this from personal experience. All right, I'm gonna get personal for the first time here. Our daughter is three and a half years old. She's not eligible for any of the vaccines that are to market right now. They're all five and up. Our wonderful pediatrician, Dr. Schramm, who we love, she had actually proudly gotten her own daughter in the previous study, in the 5 to 11 study, where she had did not get the placebo, and it, it was great. She gave us links. We said we would love to. So she's tried to give us access of here. Here, here's a study for Pfizer. Here's a study for Moderna. She was trying to give us access so we could get our daughter in study. People were not answering the phones. They were not returning our emails. A couple of them said, no, we're already full. They didn't need, they don't, they have so many volunteers out there, it's insane. As it happens on the fourth or fifth one, we finally got to one that actually accepted us and our daughter is actually one dose into uh, the Pfizer study at, at three and a half years old where she either got sugar water, placebo, 
or she got a little tiny three microgram dose, one or the other. Either way, when she was done getting it, she said, small shot, where's my ice cream? So that was the extent of how traumatic it was for our daughter, in case you're wondering. Now, there's one last thing that I didn't get to though, right? Because we talked about the money not being an issue, the scientists not being an issue, and now we know there's volunteers. There's still one last very important component. When you're testing something, you absolutely need enough of the virus or the sickness to be out there. Otherwise, how can you test? Let's say we were doing an Ebola vaccine study right now in Los Angeles. How the hell are we gonna do this? You need there to be enough Ebola out there. Otherwise, what are you comparing your placebo group to your non-placebo group? They'll be like zero cases of Ebola. Great study, that helped you. No, you need there to be enough out there for you to be able to actually see what happens with and without. And fortunately or unfortunately, there is a heck of a lot of virus out there. It is not hard to have enough enter your placebo group and your non-placebo group to actually get the proper test results. So what you end up having, yes, most things takes a few years to get to market because they don't have the money, we do. They don't have enough scientists, we did. They don't have enough volunteers, there are. And there's not enough virus out there, unfortunately there is. So when you understand that all of those components were check, 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 check. When you understand the mRNA technology was already being used to study other things out there and they just had to fill in the blanks, it actually makes sense why they were able to develop it and get it out in December of 2020. It's funny because to some people, it was way too soon and I don't trust that. To other people like me, it was like taking forever. It was like watching paint dry, waiting for the vaccine to be released. I mean, I remember it was like September and they were starting to have preliminary data in October. I'm like, come on, let's, let's go, let's go. So, you know, and then, you know, you've got the you've got the doctors who are okay with it, right? When it came out from, from that data, and then I told you, there's the doctors who waited for there to be more data in the population. So, it actually does it make sense to everybody, especially the people who are nice enough to give me their video. Does that answer make sense as to why this was fast but not scary fast? Okay. Now, I need you to also understand another thing. People will say, in a related thing of, of vaccine hesitancy, people will say, I don't trust big pharma. I'm not going to take it just because Pfizer is telling me. And I don't trust the government. I don't want to take it just because Trump or Biden are telling me. Well, guess what? I don't trust the government either for my health practices. And I don't trust big pharma either. I get that. I don't just blindly do things because the government and the pharmaceutical companies tell me to swallow that blue pill or red pill. But that's not actually how it works. Yeah, okay, the government wrote a blank check for it. And yeah, obviously a pharmaceutical company is gonna be the only company that's creating pharmaceuticals. Yes, that's how it works. But that's not where you have to just immediately say, give it to me. Because you need to understand that it's the scientists that are actually creating these vaccines. But when it's done and Pfizer or Moderna or any others release their preliminary data, that's not when it goes to market. What happens then is it goes to the FDA and they hire an independent panel of scientists and doctors to look it over and do peer reviewed research and to decide, do we accept this? Do we think that this data is sound or flawed? And there are times, there are other vaccines and times, even with a Moderna one for kids, where they actually have proven that it works, that the system works. And they look at, they say, we actually, we need you to do more testing on this group. We don't know, we don't like what you did with this. We need more data and they send it back. That's why there's not a thousand vaccines offered right now. That's why Moderna doesn't have it for every age group right now. It's, it's because the process actually works and they're actually peer reviewing it afterwards. And that's not even the last step. FDA independent panel checks it and sees if they like it, then the FDA votes on it, then it goes to the CDC. But the CDC has their own independent panel and they look it over and peer review the research. And when they decide it's okay, if they decide it's okay, then the CDC votes on it. And if, actually, if you're in the West Coast of the United States, there's yet another stop because California and a few adjoining states have their own independent panel where they look and they do their own peer reviewed research before it comes to market to decide if it's trustworthy. So it's really, really amazing how much goes into the double, triple, hundredfold checking of this. People can think it was rushed, but in reality, there's so many people looking this over and so many people who worked on this who were brilliant. And this is actually, this has been seen by so many more brilliant minds than probably 
I, I would imagine the majority of other vaccines are just come to market. It's pretty spectacular. Okay, so if somebody tells you they don't trust big pharma, neither do I. I trust the I trust the doctors and scientists who are peer reviewing the research from it. That's how I would say that. Okay, now there's a slew of other questions we're going to get to, but it's been long enough, and I need you guys to be awake. So, do one of you want to turn off your turn on your audio and ask me specifically, not just any question, specifically a common thing that you've heard of that causes vaccine hesitancy, other than what we've already discussed. I see a few people, I think, start to raise their hand first. But if you raise your hand, you're going to have to unmute. Can you hear me? I hear you perfectly. It's not a question per se, but a comment more. Most common people don't know that actual testing protocols are not supposed to take like years and years and years. Like someone once said, but they haven't tested the vaccine for 50 years. Like that's why they, it's not out yet. Like that's what happened with measles. I'm like, no, 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 that's not how it works. It's not meant to take years of testing. You know, all the, and exactly what you said, all the other things that were blocking this from happening, you know, were taken away. So that's why it happened faster. People are like, no, they took shortcuts with the actual protocols. And I'm like, no, no. Right. This it's a great it. point. It's a great point that you actually are the first person to bring up for, to bring this up. And you are right. And when people end up politicizing it, what's interesting is, is that Donald Trump's government and Joe Biden's government have in common that they both approve of and encourage the vaccine. Trump himself, in addition to Biden, has already gotten his booster. So it's 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 really it's unfortunate how politicized it's gotten. It's unfortunate when people have deliberately politicized it. It's unfortunate when it's unintentionally is. But at the end of the day, we literally had a Republican government that helped this come to market without shortcuts beautifully quickly and then continued with the Democratic government, which is continuing to release it out there. Both political parties are very highly supportive of this and of the data. So yes, ab absolutely. This, there were not shortcuts taken unless you consider having more money being able to be a shortcut to having to not ask for money along the way a lot of times. Sure, it speeds it up, but that doesn't make it a shortcut. Having more people work on it speeds it up, it doesn't make it a shortcut. Yeah. Does anybody else want to chime in with a quest, something that they often hear as a vaccine hesitant issue? Obviously, I'm going to get to all of them, but I'm trying to keep you all awake. Boaz, I, I have a, a question. Longtime listener and longtime fan. Hi, Lakshmi, one of my favorite people throughout the pandemic who has helped guide me. One of my many, many fantastic sources and resources throughout the pandemic. She is an epidemiologist, used to work years ago on tuberculosis with the CDC up in San Francisco and has been an invaluable resource here at the hospital helping us. So thank you, Lakshmi. Go ahead with your question. What are you, what are you, are you going to try to stump me and make me look no, silly? No, I'm not. I'm just going to, I'm going to actually ask a question that I get from folks and um, like you said, it's been a long two years and sometimes my own uh, ability to be a good science communicator is stymied by whatever I've dealt with that day. So a lot of times I've been asked the question, you know, the primary series of whatever vaccine I got, like that was supposed to be effective. Why do I have to get a booster? How many times am I going to have to get a booster? Why did I test positive if I got a booster? Like there's a slew of questions in that vein that I I'm wondering what would be a really what would be a, how would you approach that? Okay, so you just you asked great multiple great questions that have they're kind of different questions. So one part of what you said had to do with breakthrough infections. Why am I still getting testing positive even though I'm COVID vaccinated? You're going to have to forget my own brain lapses because this is my third session of the day. But Don't worry. Did, did I already discuss the idea that, yes, you will get breakthrough infections, but it will prevent you from getting worse, right? We talked about that. So one of the Sorry, things I, I also joined really late because I had to go it. to something else. <laughs> I apologize. That's OK. So I specifically would answer that way without reiterating it all that when it comes to breakthrough, it's, I, I, I give people the idea that goal number one of vaccine is prevented as much as you can. But even when that doesn't work, you don't need to break the glass because automatically the vaccine will take care of goal number two, which will be preventing severe illness. 
And that's what the vaccine ends up doing. And I gave an example earlier about saying that when I had the flu shot once, I don't even know if I said that here, but I had the flu shot once and I tested positive for flu, but I had a very minor case of flu, which would never have been a six hour version of influenza A had I not been vaccinated. So it's all about it being a second defense now in there. Now, the other aspect that you talked about though was asking about boosters. Now we're gonna talk a little bit more about boosters later, but the answer, the first answer and the short answer of how many am I gonna have to get? Is this the last one? Will it be every year? Will it be every six months? Will it be every? The answer is we don't know. We can't know when our last booster will be. I am predicting it's going to end up becoming an endemic situation to our population, similar to influenza, where we all have enough built in vaccine induced and in combination with natural immunity that we are going to be able to, for the most part, handle COVID. And there will be some deaths every year as there are with, COVID, with, with, with influenza every year, but, there will, but, but predominantly people will be protected. I, I, I assume it will end up being something where every year, every two years or so, it's literally just with your flu shot, you get a COVID shot. But right now we are still in the stages of figuring it out. What we do know is that one shot is more protection than no shots. What we do know is that the full series of shots, which was two shots officially, is more protective than one shot. And what we now know is that the booster, six months later, or two months later if you had J&J, is more protective than the two shots. It has not been, here's the good news. I thought that when we were going to need get the booster, that it was gonna be about, hey, your immunity is waning, and your gas is sort of running low, time to refill the gas tank. That's what I thought it was gonna be, but it actually was much better than that. Because what we learned is that we actually have more immunity with the booster than we ever had at our best point in time. And not just more, but smarter immunity. We are going to get to that. You know what, screw it, we'll go out of order. We've, 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 we've touched enough on boosters. Let's just talk about boosters now. Otherwise, I'm not going to know later what the heck we so, talk, said and didn't say. So do I need a booster? Who is eligible? 16 years old and up in this country after six months after your second dose is eligible, are eligible. Six months after dose two, if you're 16 or older, I'm sure at some point they'll open it up to younger people. Okay, I'm, I don't see a reason why they shouldn't also be. If you had Johnson & Johnson, you're eligible after just two months. Honestly, I can't imagine it's that much longer before they officially change the official guidance and stop calling Johnson & Johnson a one-shot dose. If we're being intellectually honest here, Johnson & Johnson probably should have always been a two-dose regimen. But it was very attractive to release a one dose to the market. Some people are only willing to get one dose. Some people are only capable of getting one dose. Maybe that's a homeless population. It's hard to get them on the side for it. So it's, it's important. And again, the one dose of Johnson & Johnson is better than no doses. But yeah, but OK, Mary, you wanted to ask something in the middle? Oh, I think on our memorandum sent the email about the booster, it told us that our ministry is not recommending J&J &J at all. So I okay, don't know I, I'm going to talk, when we get to specific side effects, I'm going to talk about Johnson & Johnson. I am not going to tell anybody, I have never told somebody get J&J &J as my recommended one, but J&J &J also does get a hard, a really, really bad rap and it shouldn't get as bad of a rap as it is. It is less effective, there is less efficacy, there will be more breakthroughs, there will be more severe outcomes, but it is still more protective than no vaccine. So I wanna make it very clear that J&J, &J, which is kind of like the, the ugly stepchild right now, it's really not quite fair just how bad the rap is because if that was our only vaccine now, I'd be first in line to get it. It just happens to be that there were three that came out in relatively close time and the two mRNA ones simply are better. We're going to talk about J&J &J, though. When I got to the a big part of this, probably the single biggest part of this, it's gonna be about the side effects, the, common, the side effects we read about, blood clots and heart inflammation, those things. I promise we will talk and that's when you're gonna be taking out your pens and I'm gonna give you numbers and data. But I'm gonna actually bring up J&J &J then and I'm gonna defend it a little bit from some of the bad rap it has, okay? But if you had J&J, &J, then two months later, you should already get a booster as opposed to six months later with the other ones. And you are allowed to mix and match with your boosters. So you can get whatever you want as your booster. Now here, I'm gonna give you a basic idea of 
Moderna versus Pfizer. Moderna and Pfizer are both mRNA technology. They are very, 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 very similar, similar vaccines. The biggest difference there is between them is that Moderna is 100 micrograms per dose and Pfizer is 30 micrograms per dose. So people get a, 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 a Pfizer and another Pfizer, that's 30 and 30. They, they get another a booster on top of that from Pfizer, it's another 30. Well, somebody who got the Moderna, they, start, they got 100 followed by 100 and their booster is actually cut in half. The booster for Moderna is 50 micrograms. But this also goes a long way to explaining what a lot of you probably remember. Back when you were probably getting vaccinated or hearing about the vaccines, a lot of you probably remembered people saying, oh, you Moderna, you Pfizer. Oh, yeah, I'm going to do Pfizer because Pfizer, Pfizer has less bad side effects. Oh, yeah, people with Moderna keep having fevers and Pfizer seems to be doing better. Well, it seems like there were less harsh side effects with Pfizer, but it actually makes sense if you think about it because it was triple the dose, more than triple. Right? Triple would be 90. It was 100 micrograms. So it makes sense that with something that is more than triple the dose, it's kind of rational to think that it's going to give you a little bit of a harsher inf inflammation response. But it also should and does give you a stronger level of immunity because you have triple the dose. I tell people, think of them as almost like Tylenol versus extra strength Tylenol. It's a stronger dose. Now, you have to now, you have to also understand that although there's going to be waning at some point, a few months after the second dose is when it starts goes up, 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 then it starts to wane, wane, wane. But sure enough, with Moderna, it wanes from a higher level and it wanes a little bit, a little bit slower, right? So you have a little bit more to work with in the first place. So what I recommend to people, if they are open to it, and it is not a big deal if they're not, is I tell them, you're going to get your booster? Go get a Moderna booster. You're essentially, it's fine. If you don't want to, that's totally fine. But hey, you get yourself a Moderna booster, you're gonna get 50 micrograms of Moderna. You're gonna probably feel crappy for a couple of days either way after your booster. You're probably, not everybody, but you'll probably have 48 hours of feeling kind of crummy, whatever the, the usual reactions are. So you may as well feel crummy with a maximum protection. And the Moderna 50 micrograms is still gonna be bigger than the Pfizer 30. If you don't do that and you get your Pfizer booster, or if you're one of the people on this chat and you already got a Pfizer booster, don't worry about it. My own wife, Addie, she got a Pfizer booster. It was before Moderna's booster was even available. It's fine. I'm not worried about her. I'm just saying, you're going to feel like crap. Give me the give me the best protection of all. Johnson & Johnson people, really, I recommend mixing it up. Let me tell you what happens with J&J. You get that first J&J, and now you're going to get another J&J, right? Let's just say your, your, your booster is a J&J. That's gonna do something, it is. It's gonna increase you about five-fold with your immunity levels from your first J&J. That's good, that's not bad at all, that's good. But what happens if you go from J&J &J to, a, to a Pfizer? It goes up about 30-fold, 30 30-fold. 30 and what happens if you mix it up instead from J&J &J to Moderna? It goes up about 70-fold. So considering Johnson & Johnson people are coming from the lowest level of protection, my strong recommendation to them, much more than I do to even the Pfizer people to mix it up, is for them to mix it up because that way they can sort of cut to the head of the class with the, with the rest of us, so to speak, with our efficacy levels, our immunity levels. So that's what I would say and recommend. Um, now, I'm since just so I don't forget later, since since we cut ahead and talked about boosters a little bit, I want to tell you something else that's cool about boosters. So do you remember? And, and by the way, if you're here in California locally, the easiest place to find boosters or doses, yes, you can get them from pharmacies, but they're pretty backed up. The easiest place is myturn.ca.gov. If you're here in California, myturn.ca.gov. You put in your zip code, you tell it blah, blah, blah. This is what you're looking for. It'll give you all the places in the area. Usually there's walk-ins within a few miles of you. There's honestly plenty of places that usually offer it. I, I, I look this up all the time for people who are computer illiter illiterate. Okay, now do you remember I mentioned early on that I thought a booster was just to refill your empty and gas tank, but actually it seems to do even better than that? Okay, so here we go. First piece of actual numbers I'm gonna give you. The median post booster antibody level, when they tested a whole group of people, the median, the middle post booster antibody level was three times higher than was typical for another group whose antibodies were measured a few weeks after their second dose. In English, so you can understand what I just said, with your booster, you are about two or three times higher antibody levels than you ever were at your peak before you started waning, when you were at your highest level. 
So this is not just merely refilling the gas tank. This is giving you a bigger gas tank to work with and filling that up, which is awesome because when you've got COVID or any virus for that matter, when you have something attacking you, those are the invading armies marching your way. You now want to have as many soldiers as possible to fight them off. The, co the quantity actually does matter. And I just explained to you that you're not just simply, I, I get it. If you're, I get why people would be exhausted if they were like, oh, I took it. Why do I have to take another one? It went down, it goes up, it went down, it goes up. No, it's actually better. You explain to somebody you're going to be about three times better than you ever were. And that's all the more important because something like Omicron is all the more slippery to get by you. So you need more defenders, right? Okay. There's actually something even cooler to tell you here. So we're going to talk more specifically about natural immunity. But let me tell you something. You know how people always feel like your highest immunity level should be if you caught COVID and you survived it and like a few weeks ago, I guess should be really strong as strong like bull, right? Just had COVID. Good, good natural antibody level. Well, listen to this. They took people a group of 76 people who were not vaccinated, 76 people who just got COVID two to six weeks ago. So for all intents and purposes, they should have really, 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 really good natural immunity, right? They measured them up against a group of people who had their two doses and the booster, okay? So booster people versus unvaccinated person who just got over COVID. Ready for it? The people who had the booster, had 53 times more protective antibody levels. 53 times more. That is incredible. That's incredible. And I'm not going to at any point during this try to tell you there's no such thing as natural immunity, because of course there's such a thing as natural immunity, but we're gonna talk about the differences on why and why you shouldn't rely on natural immunity alone. I'm not saying it's not protective. At some point, we're probably all gonna have some degree of hybrid immunity with the vaccine and some sort of things we catch, but I definitely would rather catch COVID once I'm vaccinated so it can protect me to give me a mild case than have to fit, get it first and hope. Now, there's another cool thing to tell you about boosters before we move on. We just talked about how quantity of boosters is way, 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 way higher, right? It goes up a lot, but Quality also matters. I'm going to read you a quote by Professor Danny Altman, an immunologist from Imperial College. Listen to this because it's pretty cool. And I didn't know this until about two weeks ago. Every dose of the vaccine triggers another round of antibody evolution within the immune system. It seeks out better antibodies that attach themselves more firmly to the virus it's a process called affinity maturation, affinity maturation. Your antibodies are a better fit as time goes on. They're getting fancier and they're getting more sophisticated. So not only is the third dose actually giving you about three times the number that you had at your best, but they're actually giving you smarter antibodies, antibodies that are actually learning, they're maturing, and they're learning how to grasp onto it more, which is yet another reason why you'd be more protective against something like Omicron or anything. So it's pretty amazing. Is that going to be true of a fourth dose, of a fifth dose, of a 17th dose down the line? I don't know. Sure, at some point, maybe every time it becomes smarter and more, we'll see. It. We'll see. Life will tell us as we go, but it certainly is true right now. Of, of, of this with a booster. And at some point, I wouldn't be surprised if they change their definition of fully immunization, full immunization to not being two doses, right, two weeks after second dose, but to actually being two doses plus a booster. And likewise with J&J &J with having it and a second one. But they haven't right now. In Israel, which is usually a few months ahead of us with the vaccinations, they've already changed their official definition to including the booster, FYI. Okay. Okay, Stu, go ahead. Uh, if somebody, let's just say me, had three uh, Pfizer uh, uh, shots, yeah, uh, and if it's possible, would it help me to go into a place and get a fourth Moderna shot? Would it help? Would it do something? I'm sure it would, but it's not recommended. There's nobody saying it, and I wouldn't start to play, you know, at home scientist right now with yourself. It's, it's I play it's, with myself when and if I want to. <laughs> 
<laughs> so you said it this time. Usually it's me. So, you know, at the end so of the day, no. if you ask me speculatively, would it actually increase things for you? I'm sure it would. But realistically, is there any need for it, especially if you are not immunosuppressed, if you're not part of the 3% of the population that has actual immunosuppression? And which is, you know, whenever we talk about the vaccine, we're talking about a predictable, wonderful factor that happens to 97% of the people, because 97% of the people are not immunosuppressed. They are not cancer patients. They are not transplant patients. They are not on immunosuppressive therapy. But for the 3% who are, they could need a lot more work. They might need more help. So I can assure you that every time and any time that there is something else offered, it's always going to be to that group first. It's going to be people who don't have the ability to have it help protect themselves, the 3%. And I don't believe you're in that group, although I don't know your whole medical history. So I wouldn't recommend it right now particularly. I think you're good with your, two, with your, with your vaccine. You have the exact same protection that my wife has. I think we need to talk about somebody who's had COVID versus somebody who has gotten vaccinated in terms of their immunity, natural immunity versus vaccine immunity, right? People are interested in that, right? I already told you just a little glimpse out of how protected we are with our antibodies with the, with the, with the booster compared to people who have only just gotten COVID. But let's talk about people who've had COVID. Now, if you have COVID, you are going to have some level, some degree of natural immunity. Anybody who tries to politicize it and make it other way, like there's no such thing as natural immunity, that's, it's just not true. It's an ignorant answer. There is absolutely a concept of natural immunity. There are vaccines out there, and I'm going to preface this by saying I am not, I am a COVID vaccine educator and expert at this point. I am not a general vaccine expert, so I'm not going to be able to start pulling down to you examples of tons of other vaccines over the years. But here's what I can tell you. There have been vaccines over the years which are less effective than the natural immunity you get. There have been vaccines over the years where, hey, you don't want to catch it, but you catch it, and now you're actually more protected than the vaccine will ever do for you. There's vaccines over the years which are the opposite, where you're going to be more protected from the vaccine than if you actually ever, uh, than, than actually uh, ca catching COVID. And we weren't sure when we started this, we weren't sure which one this would be. But here is what we actually know at this point. Because now at this point, we have hundreds and hundreds of millions of pieces of data. We know that when you are unvaccinated, but you catch COVID, you will have some unpredictable varying degree of natural immunity. You will gain antibodies. Yes, you will. How many? I don't know. Memory cells? A good amount? I don't know. Will it be adaptable to the different variants? I don't know. It's very, very, very unpredictable. If all of us on this chat session right now got COVID, we would have entirely different outcomes in terms of our natural immunity. It would be just entirely all over the place. A couple of us might have good immunity in a year. We might. A bunch of us might easily catch COVID again in three months. It's all over the map. Now, here's what you need to understand. When you're dealing with science and math, you want and you value predictability. That's what you want. You want there to be, like Rachel asked, you want there to be graphs that you could actually see, oh, look, this is how much immunity I have now statistically because I just got my second shot two weeks ago. This is how much I probably have gone down to because it's been four months since my second shot. This is how much it's up to because now I got my booster. It's great. It's why we don't have to all run all over the place like crazy people injecting or withdrawing blood from our arms and checking our antibody levels, right? If we were, if it was unpredictable right now, I'd be telling everybody, hey, everybody, stop what you're doing. Test your antibody levels right now. Stop the presses because who knows where you're at but that's not true if you're in the 97 percent of the population who has a working immune system if you're not in that three percent of the population you actually don't have a reason to get antibody tested because the vaccines are going to work in a pretty predictable level which is great but you don't have that with natural immunity maybe it's good protection maybe it's not so we say to people hey we know that it's safe for you to get the vaccine even if you've had COVID, in fact, we actually know you're going to have better protection than the rest of us, because now you're going to have a form of what's called hybrid immunity. And that's great. 
And one day we're probably all going to have hybrid immunity. I can't imagine that it's not going to be a day that we haven't all gotten some form of COVID. But by then, I hope we were all vaccinated and that we have some mild strain that doesn't do much to us. That's hybrid immunity. But we tell somebody who gets it, on average, they usually have about when after they get a dose of the mRNA vaccine, after they've had um, after they've had natural immunity, usually it is about 50 percent more that you're going to get raise your immunity thanks to that one dose. It's pretty great. And I can see background writing there. Um, Lakshmi, I'm trying not to be distracted by you typing there because it floods in the back. But Rachel, I believe Lakshmi put an infographic for you that might be exactly what you need. OK, so um, what we do know is that when you get the vaccine, you have your immunity. Great. Your antibodies, right? We know you're going to get your memory cells. We just don't have these same factors. But there's another thing we don't have the same predictability of it with natural is what I meant to say. But there's actually one last thing I want you guys to know about. And I bet that almost that I bet that almost zero people on this chat are going to be familiar with this. I bet like Lakshmi might be the only one on this chat that'll have heard of this. Did you know there are two different types of antibodies? There's two different ones. People are always just bragging when they do their, you know, antibody tests and showing their numbers, but there's actually two different ones. And you will not know which types of antibodies you have based on your numbers. It's not going to show up in a test. They would have to look under a mi microscope. A pathologist would have to look. So what are the two different types? Well, there's the type that we all take for granted and assume we have because we do generally have that very predictably with the vaccine immunity. And those are called neutralizing antibodies. Neutralizing antibodies do exactly what you would imagine they do. They neutralize the virus. They either neutralize it before it enters you so you never get infected. Yay! or they neutralize it once it's in your body and you are infected and they prevent it from going from being a common cold upper respiratory infection to being a dangerous lower respiratory tract infection in a breakthrough case still yay so neutralizing antibodies are awesome and that's what we want now there's another type of antibody that you're not going to read about nearly as much and that's called a binding antibody a binding antibody is not a bad thing. It's actually very helpful. I'm not, a, I'm, not, I'm not trying to like tell you it's some terrible antibody. It's not, but it's not neutralizing the virus. What a binding antibody does is it sees the virus, it recognizes the virus, and it flags the virus. It binds itself to the virus, and essentially it becomes a system that now tells your body, hey, look at me, look over here. It's like a beacon telling your body, this is COVID, this is COVID, come, come try to take care of this for me. Still helpful. Of course that's helpful. But it's not as helpful as one that wouldn't just tell your body to take care of it, but actually would take care of it. So again, when you catch COVID and you get natural immunity, you will have some level of, who knows, binding antibodies, neutralizing antibodies. We think probably that the more severe your case of COVID was, the more your body probably takes it seriously. And it probably correlates to you likely having better natural immunity, right? And that makes sense. If your body has some like asymptomatic nothing case, your body doesn't really have a reason to care. And so it doesn't really want to protect you in the future because it never took it that seriously. So probably after that, you don't have much immunity at all. But somebody who has a harsher case with bad respiratory symptoms and the virus is all over their mucous membrane, they're probably going to have a better case of, 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 uh, of antibodies and maybe memory cells. But again, why take the chances and just assume that it's going to be OK and assume that you're going to be adaptable to protect you against the next variant and the next variant? Get the vaccine because the vaccine is going to give you way more soldiers and way smarter soldiers. We know that already. That is the difference between natural and um, vaccine immunity. You guys good with that concept? Yeah. All right. Awesome. Now, moving on. I'm going to get to a couple of fast things before, and then we're going to get to the big one, the ones about side effects. Ah, I don't think I've mentioned this yet. We, we talked about I already had COVID. Um, I don't think we talked yet about the flu shot. Some people say that they don't like getting the flu shot because it gives them bad side effects. And some people just say, I don't get the flu shot, period. So why should I get this shot? Well, let me tell you, the flu shot has a, has a bunch of incidences where people do have bad reactions to it. I've had coworkers say, oh, flu shot makes me so sick, I never take it anymore. Well, guess what? The flu actually has egg components. And most of you probably understand that egg components can be a real sensitivity, if not an allergy, to a lot of people. So a lot of people do react badly to the flu shot. Not most, 
But and I still recommend the flu shot for the record. But it is some this has none of that. There are no egg components. So there's no reason that somebody who reacts badly to the flu shot would have a bad reaction to this because of an egg sensitivity or anything. But I do want to point out, though, to you that with the flu, the average flu deaths in the last 10 years, 36,000 flu deaths a year. The worst in the last 10 years, 61,000. The first year of COVID, 500,000. So it's really an unfair comparison to say, well, you know, I'm not as concerned about this. The flu very rarely kills people that are not elderly, severely immunosuppressed or babies and children. That's who the flu ends up affecting. COVID, sure, COVID can affect the elderly and the immunosuppressed even more, but it affects everybody. And I'm sad to know that I know people who are young with no risk factors who did die of COVID. Uh, another case brought to me just a week ago by, uh, by, by a very close friend who told me that a entire family in the East Coast was, at, was, was, was got COVID with Omicron. All of them were vaccinated except for the 22 year old son. Everyone was fine who were vaccinated. The 22 year old son died. This was literally just last week told to me um, from about somebody's friend. And I myself have lost a friend to it as well. Again, with no, no risk factors other than mild asthma. So you need to understand that COVID can and does affect everyone. It's not a, trying to scare people, I'm not trying to say it will, it'll come and get you. The majority of people who get it do survive it. But you know what? The majority of people who get measles survive measles, and we vaccinate for measles, don't we? The majority, and, and, and I believe rubella is specifically to help protect the fetus, but we still give people rubella. We don't just vaccinate people against things that we expect to kill them. We vaccinate against things, people, people against things that will lower their risk factors in their life. We want to tell them now at the end of the day, statistically and prove to them by taking this vaccine, you will be less likely to die. You will be less likely to have bad outcomes. And I will get to all of those stats. So that's about, that's the, that's the deal when it comes to specifically comparing the flu. When, what you need to understand is that every single vaccine that comes out ends up having fertility accusations. This is one of the most common accusations falsely made, thrown out there every time there's a new one. Most recently it happened with the HPV vaccine. They, they made accusations about that. Oh, it scared people. Oh yeah, they're giving it to young girls as they're reaching puberty. Sure, sure, it was based on nothing. They just made the accusation. Tons of people were afraid to get it for their kids as a result. And it takes a long time to disprove things. It doesn't matter if something is based on BS, because at the end of the day, you now have to go through studies just to disprove people's absolute lies and rumors. Well, they were able to eventually disprove it, but it took a while about HPV. Everybody knows the accusation about autism when it comes to all vaccines, right? Oh yeah, vaccines all cause autism. What a famous one. Well, again, this still prevents people from today. There's still so many people around the world who don't get vaccinated or don't vaccinate their kids because they think of the autism thing as a real accusation, even though that was again based on nothing. And again, it took years, but it was disproven. You would hope that after it was disproven, it would have just eradicated that. But alas, people still prefer to listen to their social media feeds than they do the doctors. And God forbid you have one doctor who went to an Ivy League school who disagrees with the other 99% of the doctors there, that's the person that's gonna be shared around the social media and everybody's gonna say, oh, well, look at this person, he went to Yale. He's a good doctor and he's disagreeing with it. Look at this person who used to work for Pfizer and doesn't agree with it. That's not how science works. You take the consensus of data with science and you look at the consensus. You have a hundred doctors in the room all giving you the same opinion on what you should do with your bad back and one doctor in that room disagrees with them. How many people are gonna now ignore the hundred and just listen to the one? That's not how data works. That's not how science works. It doesn't mean you have to ignore that person. I'm not telling you we can't listen to other things. But at the end of the day, there's a reason that 96% of doctors all got vaccinated back in May, June before the mandates, because they're reading the research. Okay, now, as for fertility, you wanna know the really dumb, cool story of how the rumor started this time? There was, I don't even know, Lakshmi might not even know this story. 
there was a some sort of a symposium early on in 2020 when they started to analyze this thing called a spike protein. So they were looking at this protein, the spike protein to do with COVID. And there were a bunch of doctors on there. And one doctor in particular who works in women's health said, oh, is that COVID, pro, COVID uh, spike protein? Is that anything like this protein? And he was talking about a protein that's on the placenta, placent, a placental cell protein. And they said, no, this is nothing, spike, this has nothing to do with that. There's nothing to do with each other. Okay, it was, it was an honest question. He's learning about a protein. Is that like this protein? No, done. He, he was satisfied. Well, the social community, the social media community was not satisfied because they extrapolated that random question and used that as a way to kickstart the rumor that, oh, it affects your placenta, doesn't it? Well, then it must affect fertility and it must cause miscarriages and it must cause fetal abnormalities and all of these other things that are just false, false, false accusations. Now let's talk about what's actually real. So should I vaccinate when I'm already pregnant when I'm breastfeeding? So I'm going to be honest here. The CDC did not do itself any favors by months and months and for months and months after the vaccine came out, not officially standing behind it and saying, yes, 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 do it. They were waiting for more data. So they were basically hemming and hawing and saying, talk to your talk to your OB guy. And now put yourself in the shoes of all of these OB guys around the country. These are not scientists. These are OB guys. They're getting the research when it's given to them. And suddenly they're put in a position where they have to make this determination without the backing of the CDC telling them what to do. It was really hard. Now, the majority of OB guys did actually, from talking to each other and reading what they were reading, say, you know what? It's actually going to be safer to get it than not. And they were recommending it. But there were plenty that still were holding off and saying not yet. OK, so. What ended up happening was that finally, after months of that, they did have enough data and the CDC started to officially answer, yes, please get vaccinated when you are pregnant, when you are breastfeeding. But it was more than just that. The American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists also said, please get vaccinated. We highly recommend it when you're pregnant, when you're breastfeeding. The Society for Maternal Fetal Medicine also stood behind it and said, please get vaccinated when you're pregnant, when you're breastfeeding. What we ended up seeing is that when they actually started to study and look and see people with fertility problems, miscarriages, fetal abnormalities, stillborn births, births and people who are getting vaccinated, is we saw no increase in any of those issues. None. In fact, we started to see the opposite because by protecting the mother during it, actually we had better outcomes. So let me give you, here's, here's a statistic for you. Stillborn deaths, stillborn deaths, a very sad statistic when a baby is born not alive. Before the pandemic, it was 0.59% of pregnancies that, was, that ended up with a baby not being alive, 0.59%. Once the original came out, the alpha, it went up all the way to 0.98%, which is a pretty strong increase already just from alpha. I wish that was the end of the data, but it gets worse with Delta. With Delta, stillborn births, have gone all the way up to 2.7% of the pregnancies. 2.7% resulting in a baby that's not alive. That is tragic and it is tragic additionally because it's so unnecessary and preventable. Because what we end up seeing is now we have tens of millions of pieces of data out there. Granted, it's not the first month where they have to take the word of it for people like D David Agus who was saying there's nothing to it and take it. Now. For months and months, you've been able to see the data where you're able to actually see there is no increase in fertility problems. There is no increase in miscarriages. There is no increase in stillborn deaths. We actually see this and we actually know this. And what we do see is that if you're not vaccinated, that's when you're going to have an increase in all of the problems because you get COVID and you can have all of these problems leading up to and including death. And I had a session two weeks ago, one of my first sessions where I had the wonderful PIC team of our hospital, who are an awesome team of nurses, and they were actually telling me that not once or twice, but a whole handful of times in the pandemic, they have had to sadly be witness to pregnant mothers who are unvaccinated and who have died. 
mother and baby in the hospital. And I have asked them, did you see this happen with any, unvaccin with any vaccinated pregnant mothers? And they said, no, that was their answer. It's unbelievably more protective if you are vaccinated. And that includes you're pregnant now and it's time for your booster, then get it. Get your booster, get the Moderna one. Hey, Boaz, can I add something to that? Go what ahead, Lakshmi. The PIC team said, I mean, you know, yes, these mothers and babies are dying, but also like the amount of pain and uh, complexity of everything they receive while they're trying to save their lives. It's just, it's heartbreaking how much goes into saving people who just can't be saved because they haven't been vaccinated. Like the course of the illness is just remarkably different when you don't have the immune protection from vaccines. I I appreciate it. That's depressing as all hell, and I appreciate it. I wish I could have you on for all of my sessions. Um, I'm not sure. I'm if other here people for want. all the really Debbie Downer moments. I promise. Yeah, I, I can listen. provide lots of examples. It's been a rough I, two years. I very much appreciate it, and I'm sure other people do as well. Um, so. I need to remind people, miscarriages, you have to know this. I assume you all know this. They are very, very common, period, end of story. Miscarriages are about one in four pregnancies, okay? Most, people's, most people I know have had a miscarriage, quite honestly, amongst their children. So yes, it's going to happen that somebody who's been vaccinated a week later also has a miscarriage. It's gonna happen somewhere. I've seen those memes somewhere or other. And it could be true because one in four pregnancies is going to end up with a miscarriage. But causation and correlation are not the same thing. And we don't have to just guess and take my word for it because we actually know that there has not been an increase in miscarriages from people who are vaccinated. So we, we're not even guessing at this point. Okay, now, I'm gonna connect this entire, does everybody feel good about the fertility concept and so on? Everybody all right? You have a question, Leora? Not a question per se, but I do wanna point out, I don't know if this is something you wanted to, to actually mention, that women have reported changes in their menstrual cycles Periods. post vaccine, right? So they're looking into that, um, but that's also Correct. throwing people off. You're 100% right, thank you. I've had a couple of sessions I remember to mention that, but I didn't in today's sessions. You are 100% right. Throughout the pandemic, I have had a few people who've come to me who actually happened to them. It's I don't know the prevalence of it, but there are people where it has thrown off their menstrual cycles. And if you think about it, it makes some level of logical sense to me. Again, inflammation in your body can certainly cause a, a little bit of inflammation to your endometrial lining, right? And it can affect things. And think about it, when people have periods and sometimes they grow up with them irregular periods, one of the things that they end up doing sometimes is they put them on birth control for a bit, regulate their periods and they get them off of it. So for a few people who I actually know who have told me that it's affected their periods, and there's not many, but there are a handful, I've actually suggested that they talk to their OB and see what they think about maybe going for a few months on birth control. And a couple of them actually took the advice. The OBs thought it was a great idea and they did it and it corrected it. Same as it does for people earlier on. And you're totally right, Leora. That's another reason somebody might make a leap and think, oh, affected my period, therefore must make it impossible or a big risk factor to not have children. But one thing does not have to do with another. But it stinks that there is that side effect in some people that they might have a more painful or more frequent or heavier or heavier flow with their period. 100%. I also, yeah, I also wanted to point out something that a fellow uh, doctor friend of ours also pointed out to me with that, in that many vaccines are very likely to cause that to happen as well. The only reason you don't see it more is because many of the vaccines given to children are before they actually start menstruating. Ah. So it could very well be that it could have happened with maybe MMR, maybe with polio. But the fact of the matter is, is that their body hasn't developed yet in order to have that side effect. Which is awesome. And that leads us to the next part, which is saying a very important fact. In the history of vaccines, any vaccine, all vaccines, literally every vaccine that's ever come to market, there has never, ever, 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 ever been a vaccine that has caused a fertility problem. They can make that accusation time after time again, and it will always cause setbacks due to vaccine hesitancy because people will believe it, but it has never happened ever before. Now, 
What you do need to understand also is somebody else might say, hey, not just fertility, but how do I know that there's not going to be some other side effect down the line in three years that will cause a problem? Sure, fertility like we talked about, cancer, MS. What if that's going to happen down the line and we just don't know yet? Well, again, that leads me to tell you something else. In the history of vaccines, in every vaccine ever created, there has never, ever, ever been a delayed down the line side effect that has happened. It has never happened. There have been accusations which have been disproven about, you know, cancer being caused, about fertility like we talked about, about autism, obviously. But they've always been nothing more than accusations. They've all been disproven. Every single vaccine side effect, which is going to be the big part we're going to get to that I keep promising, every vaccine side effect, even if it stinks, it happens in the first two months, usually in the first four to six weeks, certainly in the first four to eight weeks. All of them. Blood clots, yes. Bell's palsy, yes. Yen barre, yes. Heart inflammation, yes. And we're going to talk about all of those things with numbers. Okay. Now, listen, I get it. Somebody might say, all right, it's never ever happened before, but how do we know this isn't going to be the first time it happens? At the end of the day, I'm going to re remind everybody. There is nothing in life that's 100%. There's no doctor in the world or scientist in the world or anybody in the world who's a prophet. We are always taking our medical decisions based on actual risks versus actual benefits. We know the actual risks are nothing compared to the actual benefits of this vaccine. We know that anything you're worried about, this being the first one ever to cause a problem down the line delayed, that's an imaginary risk. I didn't say that that's an impossible risk, it's not 100% that that can't happen, but it's an imaginary risk right now. So you can weigh imaginary risk versus actual risk. Actual risk will win every time. Okay, now we've talked about fertility. We've talked about the newness of it and how they come to market quickly. We've talked about stillborn and so on. We've talked about natural versus vaccine immunity, long-term side effects, flu shots. It's time to get to the biggest hesitant thing of all, side effects. Unusual, unpleasant, dangerous, sometimes deadly side effects of the vaccine. So let's start with Johnson & Johnson, which is an adenovirus technology, right? So it's not the same technology. It got a really bad rap. And one of the biggest things that scared people was blood clots. Blood clots are causing are, be, are being caused and going out there. So let's analyze these blood clots. Why don't we? 16 point million doses of Johnson & Johnson have been given. 16.9 million doses. Certainly far less than the other two. How many blood clots have we seen out of those 16.9 million? 57. 57 blood clots out of 16.9 million. How many deaths out of those? Nine. Nine deaths. Now we see that the highest risk factor seems to be women of childbearing age, but what we really see the most of the time is that this is happening to people who have a specific condition called thrombocytopenia syndrome. That's where you have low platelets. If somebody has low platelets, that can have a direct correlation in putting them at risk for clots. These, the majority of these people ended up having that as a major risk factor. But I'm not going to remove them from this and just to try to make it look better. Let's include all 57 cases and the nine deaths. And that means that based on Johnson & Johnson, what is the statistic that you can get a blood clot from Johnson & Johnson? One in 300,000. One in 300,000. Now, moving on from that, comparatively, do you want to know what the chances are of getting a blood clot if you're pregnant? Just a pregnant person, not COVID, just pregnant. A pregnant person has one to two cases of blood clots per thousand, per 1,000. One to two cases per thousand, as opposed to one per 300,000. Birth control? Birth control, you're at risk for blood clots somewhere between 0 0.3 up to 1% at risk for blood clots. We are screaming from the hills, damn you, Johnson & Johnson, for your blood clots. Well, what else can also cause blood clots besides Johnson & Johnson, besides pregnancy, besides birth control? COVID. COVID, 
creates a huge risk factor for blood clots. How much more likely is it to get it from COVID than from Johnson & Johnson? Because yes, it is more likely from COVID than Johnson & Johnson, eight to 10 times more likely. So this bad, bad vaccine that scares everybody because of the blood clots is actually, if you think about it, yes, it increases your chance. It has a side effect of potential blood clots. But if you actually realize that you're lowering the chances eight to 10 times of getting a blood clot, because it's not Johnson and Johnson or and some elective thing, it's Johnson and Johnson in that case, or COVID, because we're all gonna catch COVID. So at the end of the day, by getting this, which by getting this vaccine, you are lowering your chances eight to 10 times of blood clots itself. Okay. The other thing that Johnson and Johnson can cause is Guillain-Barre syndrome. Neither of these syndromes, not, not blood clots and not Guillain-Barre, are at all risk factors from mRNA vaccines. So everybody who's in healthcare who's listening to me, please keep in mind Moderna and Pfizer, which are the gold standards right now, they have no risk factors of blood clots or Guillain-Barre. But Johnson and Johnson, before we leave this topic, again, Guillain-Barre. So let's go through the statistics. Guillain-Barre, 278 cases because of Johnson and Johnson. 278 cases out of 16.9 million. That is mostly men over 50, just so you know. So what are the statistics of them getting it from Johnson and Johnson? That is 0.0016% getting it from Johnson and Johnson. 0.0016%. Now, drum roll, what else can you get Guillain Barre from? COVID, right? This is going to be the pattern. You can also get Guillain Barre from COVID. Which one is it more likely to get it in? COVID. How much more likely is it to get Guillain Barre from COVID than from Johnson and Johnson? It is 0.015% likelihood of getting it from COVID. That is 15 cases per 100,000. So I haven't done the final math, but feel free to do it yourself. 0.015% getting it from COVID versus 0.00. 1-6% getting it from J&J. &J. It is exponentially more likely, once again, to get it from COVID. So I, I do feel that sort of brief need to defend Johnson & Johnson because it gets a very bad rep for its side effects, but in reality, it's actually far more protective than it is dangerous. But yes, the other ones are even more protective, so let's talk about them. Now, before we move on to the specific ones about mRNA, I want to point out one thing. I have asked the heads in multiple hospitals of hematology and oncology and cardiology and pulmonology and neurology, amongst others, are there any conditions that you would say to somebody, don't get it, give them a medical exemption, more dangerous, too dangerous, don't do it. The answer, well, I will tell you, in the first month or so, way back in like December, January last year, they, there was a neurologist here who I love, Cliff Siegel, and he told me at the time, I'm waiting for more data for my MS patients, and I think there was one other, maybe Guillain-Barre, waiting for more data on those. Within a couple of months of that, he said, oh, Boaz, for them too, everybody can get it now. And why? They had enough data and they saw that with all of these cases, whether it was MS or anybody else, your risk factors are so high if you get COVID. The COVID is gonna cause a tremendous amount of damage to you, even more so if you have these risk factors. So it's still safer to get the vaccine than to get COVID. So what, so I've, I have consistently now found there are zero, zero medical conditions that any of them feel are actual, legitimate, yeah, that's a medical exemption, they shouldn't get it. But no, there is one, and this is a kind of a predictable one, anaphylaxis. If you have an actual anaphylactic allergy to COVID vaccine. But here's the really interesting part. People who go into it just saying, I have an allergy to vaccines, because those are so graded on different levels and what the reaction are, and there's different types of vaccines, they're still recommended to get the first shot. They're recommended to go through their allergist under the medical care of their allergist, be observed, given the first shot. If they have a bad reaction, then they are told, don't get your second shot, done. That's a real medical exemption right there. If on the other hand, as in many cases, they under the care of their allergist got that first shot and have no problem, no reaction, 
good to go. They get their second dose, they get their booster and so on and so forth. How often is anaphylaxis? Five people per million, five people per million. So right there you have your total number of people that are still recommended to get that first shot. Okay, are you guys ready for the mRNA big one? This is it. Myocarditis, pericarditis, heart inflammation. This is a big one. This is on the news pretty much every day. This is probably one of the biggest reasons that people are afraid to get their children vaccinated. So this is a big one. So we're gonna talk about this and bear with me. There was a study done that was, I believe, back in May or June, where they had 19,378 college male athletes, all right? Just under 20,000 college male athletes, all of whom who got COVID. And they analyzed them and studied to see how many of them reported, co reported myocarditis, pericarditis. From not, it's nothing to the vaccine, this is from COVID, right? Because yes, spoiler alert, just like the other things I told you, myocarditis, pericarditis can come from COVID too. We're gonna go into the data. So. What percentage of them ended up having it reported? 0.7% of those healthy young male athletes, which by the way is the biggest risk factor for myocarditis, being a young male and for some reason athletic uh, person. So another study, I'm gonna give you a few things here. Another study was just under 1600. There were 1,597 athletes. These athletes actually agreed, these all got COVID, all right? These are COVID positive, unvaccinated athletes, young male, 1,597 of them. So this is a high risk age group, right? They got COVID. They all agreed to get MRIs done, regardless of what happened, that to get MRIs done. So they could have scanned them as part of their study. 0.31% of them actually had myocarditis, pericarditis symptoms when they actually like reported it, 0.31%. But, but when they did the MRI, it turned out to be actually pretty insidious what was happening because 2 point, uh, I'm sorry, 2.3% actually had heart inflammation when they did the MRI. So it wasn't 0.31% that actually had it, it turned out to be a provable 2.3% that had it, which is pretty high and pretty disturbing. And that actually is pretty disturbing to doctors and cardiologists because at least if you have symptoms, you know, you report it, you treat it. But if you don't actually realize it's happening and it's insidious when it's happening in most cases, then that actually means there's a strain on your heart that's happening that most people don't even know about. And that's not good. That can cause long-term, short-term or long-term damage. That, by the way, would touch on the idea of long COVID that Stu brought up that we're gonna talk about later. If somebody thinks that they're fine and COVID's over, but it turns out that they actually have heart inflammation from their symptoms or from a scan, that would be a definite, that would be a, a case of long COVID, right? COVID's gone, but you still have inflammation on a dangerous organ in your body. We're going to talk about that more. Now, so 0.31% with symptoms, 2.3% when scanned, which is 7.4 times more likely when you actually did the scan. Now, I can give you some more studies, but I'm gonna go ahead and skip ahead to the worst looking study, the one that makes the mRNA vaccines look bad, all right? I'm not gonna try to rose it up and make it look as pretty as possible. I'm gonna make the vaccines look as ugly as possible. I'm gonna play devil's advocate. So amongst these various studies, some of which you know, I had given percentages of how much the vaccine caused. Here's the worst of the studies. There were 12 to 15 year old males, very high risk age group, right? 12 to 15 year old males. And how many of them from getting the Pfizer dose were getting myocarditis, pericarditis? 200 per million, 200 cases out of every million. What is the prevalence? What's the percentage? Zero point. 0.02%, so 0.02% prevalence. All right, so I want you to remember something right now. I just gave you the highest worst prevalence in the worst age group, right? Where they're actually having 0.02% prevalence because of the vaccine, the vaccine's causing it. Well, I need you to remember, what were we seeing in the previous study of young males getting it from COVID, that it was even without the scans, even without the insidious MRI cases, it was 0.31% cases. So 0.31% were getting it from COVID and 
0.02% from the vaccine. I'll do the math for you. That is 15 and a half times more prevalent in COVID. 15 and a half time, more times more likely. I could have given you studies that would have made it look like it was hundreds of times more likely with other studies, but I'm giving you the least good looking study. I'm painting the least nice picture because I want to make a point here and play devil's advocate that even in that study of 0.02% prevalence in that high risk group, it's still 15 and a half times better than getting it from COVID. Just wanted to point that out. Now, there's something else that I want to point out too. That's just quantity of cases, but did you know that there's actually a difference in severity of cases? So the average person who is hospitalized because they got myocarditis, pericarditis from COVID versus from the vaccine. Well, let's say the average case from getting from of hospitalization from getting the vaccine, right? The average one of those people are getting one day in the hospital under observation and ibuprofen and they go home. One day, observation, ibuprofen, home. That's your average case of myocarditis, pericarditis, thanks to the COVID vaccine, which still sucks. I don't want that to happen to me or my child. What's the average case of hospitalization from myocarditis, pericarditis, from COVID? Six days, intense life-saving techniques. They are apples and oranges in terms of not just the quantity, which we know is at least 15 and a half times more, but is actually in the quality as well. Thankfully, in both sets of cases, the majority of, of people are do survive it. They do get reversed, even after their six days in the hospital, if they got it from the virus, they're usually able to go home after severe, you know, severe anti-inflammatories and so on. But it's, you don't want that. And it's so much, so much more prevalent and, and so much worse in COVID versus the vaccine. Everybody good with that huge topic of heart inflammation? Everyone's good? Okay, because I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna now tell you one last one last um, side effect, and this one is also from the mRNA. Somebody just brought this up to me the other day, and nobody had before. Bell's palsy. If you don't know what Bell's palsy is, that's the one where you might hear about uh, somebody's face getting par paralysis, paralysis in the face from the vaccine, right? So you need to understand that paralysis in the face, Bell's palsy, is something that is a risk factor in every single viral vaccine in existence and every single flu shot. Every flu shot we get every year, every viral vaccine, not only is it a risk factor, but it's the same degree of risk in those. They actually have more than run the numbers. Remember, we're dealing with hundreds of millions of doses. And we see that there is just as much risk of it from this vaccine as it is from all the viral vaccines and flu shots. But that might not be good enough for you because you might be somebody who's like, okay, but I don't get flu shots. So <laughs> why would I want to take this chance now? All right, let's run the numbers really quickly like I did with the blood clots, like I did with Guillain-Barre and like I did with myocarditis, pericarditis. Running the numbers, 200 and, no, sorry, looking at Guillain-Barre. Here we go, Bell's palsy. sorry. All right. The prevalence after the mRNA vaccine, after the mRNA dose, 0.00026%. So the prevalence after mRNA from the vaccine of the facial paralysis, 0.00026%. What's the prevalence from COVID? Because, yep, it's also caused by COVID, 0.08%. So you've got 0.08% from COVID versus 0.00026%. Like every other example I've given you, it is caused by COVID if it's not caused by the vaccine. And the vaccine is caused by exponentially less likelihood. So again, taking the vaccine, although you might feel like you're increasing your side effect for any of these things that we've discussed, in reality, you are decreasing your risk for those same side effects because you are preventing COVID or at least preventing severity in COVID. And if you're curious about Bell's palsy, uh, over 90% of those cases do resolve on their own or with steroids. And that's more common, for some reason, more common in Pfizer than Moderna. I have no idea why. So those, that is, I just gave you the biggest part of the lecture, which has to do with those side effects. Now, we've talked about boosters. So we actually, we actually did, did one of our things out of order, which was a big one. But I'm, I'm going to not have questions yet because I know that technically we should be done in about 10 minutes.
but we won't be. I'm sure it'll be about another 20 minutes, just to warn you. We're going to now talk about children, children five to 11. This is a very important one to discuss and it's a hot topic, all right? And when we're done with this, we're just gonna mention briefly advice on how to test properly and a couple of new medications coming out and we'll be done. Now, the first thing you need to understand with children is that there is a pediatrically sized dose for the children's dose. Five to 11 is a 10 microgram dose. Do you remember I told you before that Pfizer is 30, Moderna is 100? This is a Pfizer dose that's 10. So it's already been sized differently based on the research and the trials. It's been sized to a third of the normal Pfizer dose and a tenth of the Moderna dose. So it's very small compared to them. And the next, the next one, the one that they're actually testing now on people in the Pfizer trials, including my own daughter, is uh, three micrograms. So it's going to be even smaller, but they're still working on it. So who knows what the final will be with that, right? I'm not going to talk about things that are still a work in progress. So 10 microgram dose. Now, talking about kids age 5 to 11 specifically, over 2,000 kids got tested with this where they got the dose and they did not have any bad side effects. But it actually is more than that. There were over 13,000 children who actually, before the vaccine was, was released to their age group, were actually given the full adult dose. How is that possible? Well, Doctors are allowed to order things off label. They can. I mean, a doctor is allowed to order you a cancer medication for your migraines if they want to. I mean, there's things like that that just exist. The FDA and the CDC begged. They said, please don't prescribe this to anybody who it's not been released for. But some doctors, maybe under the pressure of certain parents or not, said, screw it. And they, they actually ordered it. And I am happy to tell you that out of about another 13,000 cases of kids, under 12 who did not get the pediatric dose they should have gotten of 10 micrograms, they got triple the dose, 30 micrograms, and they still had no adverse side effects, which is great. So that's actually over 15,000 in the data before it came out. Now we're already at the point in time where there's been over 5 million doses. We're close to 5 million, which have been given first and second. And I'm not gonna say there have been zero, but I could tell you that as of like a week ago, there were still zero bad side effects. I think at this point, because it has to catch up at some point, somebody statistically, so I think there's been one or two cases of a, of a, of a child getting myocarditis, pericarditis. I'm sure it's happened. Let's just assume that it's happened because statistically it's inevitable going to happen at some point. But do I really have to take you back to all the data we talked about to explain that it's actually lowering the chances of getting myocarditis, pericarditis from COVID rather than getting it from the vaccine. It's pretty amazing. And kids are doing fantastically with this. Much lower side effects on average from it, just in general. Even those few days of just feeling crummy have been less severe. So that's good to know. Now, in terms of kids age five to 11, it has been, specifically in America, age five to 11, it has been the eighth leading cause of death for that age group. Once Delta hit, it became the sixth, the sixth leading cause of death for that age group. Now, there's also been 100 deaths in that age group in America. There has been 8,000, approximately 8,000 hospitalizations in that age group. A third of those hospitalizations in that age group have been ICU care. And for good measure, there have been about another little more than 2,000 cases in that age group who have had sepsis, multi-inflammatory syndrome, MISC, which is pretty dangerous and can lingeringly be dangerous for thereafter. Now, it's interesting because depending on who you are reading this, you could see this and depending on the news and how they report it and the people and how they perceive it, you could see this and say, holy crap, that's terrifying. I don't want that. I don't right? Or you could also look at this and say, oh, well, it's not that many, 8,000 out of all the kids in America. It's not that many. 100 deaths, that's not that many. All of these things. Well, first of all, let me tell you what most pediatricians have told me, which is you should not be having this expectation that you should be comparing numbers of kids being hospitalized and dying to adults being hospitalized and dying. As pediatricians, they want you to have the right to feel a sense of normalcy and safety, that your kid is going to survive, that your kid is not going to be 
is part of these statistics. And at the end of the day, it's not about scare tactics, but if it's safer to have the vaccine than not, wouldn't you want to? If we want to take that sixth leading cause of death since Delta and make it the 25th leading cause of death, shouldn't we want to do that? Now, one of the more disturbing aspects that I've learned about this is that, you know how we've come to accept that people who have underlying conditions, right, that they're going to be the people that are going to be the most hard hit because they have their cancers and so on. So you would probably expect, as I did, that the majority of kids are probably the ones that are very sad cases. Maybe they have severe childhood asthma. Maybe they have leukemia. I mean, we know there's kids out there who have horrible illnesses. So you might say, hey, I'm sure that's like the vast majority of those people. Well, I was actually shocked to learn that 45% of the kids who have been hospitalized and died had absolutely no underlying conditions. 45% were healthy, had no risk factors, and fit into that. So if you think you can sort of be creative and get around it and say, okay, maybe if my kid was unhealthy, I would do it, but since they're healthy, I'm not worried, just keep that in mind. Now, again, you might still look at all of this and still feel a certain way. And again, I want to tell you, I've talked now to numerous pediatricians, and some of them are extremely, extremely, uh, you know, careful, and, and some of them are very liberal with their stuff and very much, I don't want to use liberal and conservative in the wrong way, but let's just say some of them are very anti-mask in kids, right? Some of them are very, want kids to just have their normalcy and just be playing and enough is enough. And some of them might say, oh no, the kids should still be masking up outdoors and running around, right? Some of them believe in mandates. Some of them say that mandates are terrible, especially with kids. But what they've all had in common when I've talked to them is, oh, I really do recommend though that all of my you know, that my patients do get vaccinated. It's still safer. I still want them to be as safe as possible. I still recommend them. I don't want to scare them into getting it. So I try my best not to use scare techniques, but it's still safer too. And at the end of the day, you should want to do what's safer for your kid. But here we go to answer Stuart's question from hour plus ago, long COVID, long haul COVID. This to me, personally has been probably the most impactful reason of why I want kids to be vaccinated personally, why I want my daughter to be vaccinated. Because it's true, at the end of the day, statistically, it's unlikely that my own child would be that would be hospitalized, right? We all know the majority of people survive COVID, their kids of their kids are, are do do well with COVID, right? So I have a very close colleague who is a pediatric pulmonologist in a Southern California pediatric hospital. The only reason I'm not going to name this person or name the hospital is because the hospital with their red tape never got around to my sessions to giving permission for me to quote them. So talking about them without naming them. What she has seen in the pediatric hospital in the pulmonology departments for the lungs is case after case after case after case of parents bringing in their children and their children reporting shortness of breath. And then they do a scan to see what's happening and they're finding there's inflammation in the lungs. And they ask them, has your kid had COVID? And in all of the cases, they not only had COVID, but it was in the previous one to six months. And here's kind of the craziest part it was always mild or asymptomatic COVID. Mild or no symptom COVID. And that's what they're seeing time and time again in their pulmonology department. Well, they started to talk to the cardiology department. What are you seeing in the pediatric hospital? And they are seeing, huh, we're actually getting a whole bunch of kids that keep coming in where they have chest pain and we're scanning them and they have myocarditis or pericarditis. And the one thing they have in common is that they had COVID one to six months ago and their cases of COVID were mild or asymptomatic. And then they talked to the neurology department and they said that they are having parents come in that they're noticing eventually their kid seems to be more forgetful. They have what's called brain fog. They just seem to be a little bit more forgetful, harder to concentrate. Not really something you're going to rush your kid into the hospital for, right? And they're getting scanned 
And when they get scanned, they actually see that the brain has inflammation. And all of those cases have been cases where the kids have had COVID in the previous one to six months, mild or asymptomatic. It is unbelievable and uncanny and canny that it is all mild to asymptomatic cases that they're seeing across the board. And they're talking to other pediatric hospitals across the country. And she was telling me that they're getting confirmations of this happening everywhere throughout. And they're doing studies now on long COVID. And I wish I could give you actual studies that, are, that they're working on now, but they're starting to take it very seriously to look at this because this does happen in children and in adults, but yes, in children as well. And some of the parents actually say, ah, no, 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 my didn't have COVID, didn't have COVID. They're onto this enough that they know, okay. And they do a serological test. They check for antibodies and they're like, yeah, your kid had COVID. So again, asymptomatic cases, the parents may not, may not have even known about. And that can be very dangerous because these are people in this case, if they didn't know about it this whole time, that means it's an insidious case. This kind of fits in with what I was describing before with the athletes where we thought it was 0.31% that had myocarditis, pericarditis, but when they scanned them, uh-oh, it went up to 2.3% if I remember my numbers. So. The fact that we know this is happening and we know that this is happening even with children, it's again, it's not about like scare you, go watch your kids. It's about this is why, this is why she was telling me that all the pediatricians in her hospital, the day that the five to 11 dose was available, were like they were all getting it for their kids. So it's really, really eye opening because what do the rest of us have? We have our social media feeds. And we have each other and we're just like, oh, it seems like it's not dangerous. I know people who have had COVID and their kids and their kids are all fine. I'm not trying to scare anybody, but we don't know that all of those kids are fine. We don't actually know that those kids don't actually have brain, heart or lung inflammation going on right now. Statistically, some of them are going to. And why do we want to put ourselves in that position? If we can take our pediatrician's advice, the advice of the AAP, right? Or is that the Academy of American Pediatrics, if I remember there, what it stands for, who recommend, please get this for your children. And it's not just the AAP. It's, if I recall, it's the, uh, it's also the Pediatric Infectious Disease Society, I believe they're also called, also recommend it. So it's just a matter of it's safer to get it than not to get it which is pretty much the same advice when we go down through everything we're talking about. We're proving why each thing might have risks, but it's safer to get rather than not to get. And we see kids doing extremely well with the vaccine so far. We're really seeing a lot, millions of cases. We're seeing extremely good outcomes with them. Now, before I move on to a completely different thing and talk about, um, and talk about testing, and talk about a couple of other things before I have to get off, which will be in 20 minutes when my next session starts. Does anybody have any questions specific to children that weren't answered by that? Specific to children. Okay, and if anybody just- Hi, I have on, a question. Yeah, go ahead, Rochelle. Hi, so um, I guess a very specific question, and it's kind of vaccine hesitancy related and child related, but for people who are on the cusp of the age um, between the child dose and the adult dose, um, who are waiting maybe because, and this is what I hear a lot because I have a daughter who's 11 turning 12. Right. What would you, I mean, for, for people who basically say, look, they're, they're little, their bodies are little, and we don't, we don't necessarily want the higher dose, or maybe we prefer the higher dose, so we're waiting. It kind of cuts both ways, depending on who I you're can, talking I, to. I, it's a great question, which 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 you originally brought to my attention, and I, and I thought it was a great question. I can tell you the AAP officially gave an answer to this, officially said that, what do I do if I get my first dose? And, 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 and Leora, you'll answer in a second, but what do I do if I get my first dose and I'm one age, and then I turn the next age group where it's a higher dose? They actually said, get the smaller dose for your first dose when you're under when you're 11 and then when you turn 12 you'll get the higher dose that is the official recommendation i see no reason to disagree with it now if somebody told me that in next week their kid was turning 12 and i probably knowing myself because i'm so i'm such a big believer in the vaccines being helpful that and you know that i would probably just be like i'd probably at that point wait a week and just get the higher dose for both but honestly genuinely i i would follow the aap 
What were you going to say, Leora? So I just want to say, based on personal experience, so my son is turning 12 in January. Um, and the question was, exactly, do I work with the pediatric nurse? Do I get it sooner? and that, Or do I wait? And the recommendation was, is don't wait, just get him the pediatric dose, it's fine, you know, and that's exactly what's happening. Today he's actually getting his second dose, so, and it's going to be good. Yep. Congratulations, and, and I'm sure he'll do great. Kids kids do really well with it. They're uh -huh. much, much easier side effects than parents. If uh -huh. you guys can. And what about, yeah. sorry, what about the other way around? Because I also have friends whose kids just, let's say, just turned 12 or 12, 13, and they're saying, my kid is the same size as my 10 year old, for example, and I have no choice but to get the adult dose. And I'm not willing to do that because it doesn't make sense that arbitrarily just because, you know, a few months I, ago they had turned. I, right. No, I, 12. I, understand. I understand. There's always going to be. And so they're off. planning to wait like a year, let's say. And I would tell them that that's just not the wisest planning because the testing was done on people 12 and up. They included people being tested at the age of 12 and the age of 13 and 14 and 15 and 16. Does it mean right. that? And what I would also tell them is look at what happened to the 13,000 people who got triple the dose and got the adult dose who shouldn't have. They also did really well. So yes, at a certain point, right. it might feel arbitrary when you're on the cusp, but I would definitely say that waiting why would you do that to yourself when at the end of the day you're putting them more at risk now for whatever happens with heart inflammation and everything else that has to do with covid we already know and have proven that your risks go down from getting the vaccine not up and we have not seen right. oh bad outcomes with the 12 year olds but the 13 year olds are doing well so i i that's what right. i would say is that waiting is, is simply playing with science yourself and tinkering with science yourself when it has already been played with and, and tinkered with using a scientific method by thousands of scientists and doctors. COVID testing. This is such an important one that I want everybody to listen to because there is nobody, I don't care if you're a healthcare provider or you're unemployed or you're a plumber, everybody needs to know how to properly and when to properly test. Especially right now when everybody's getting phone calls every day about somebody else they know catching COVID. So listen to the testing recommendations. And this is the first time that I'm going to say anything, and I'll tell you when I do, that actually in any way deviates from the official recommendation. All right, I'm going to explain to you, I'm going to explain to you things. There's two different types of tests. There is the rapid test, which is an antigen test. The rapid test antigen testing is specifically looking for active virus in you. So it needs infectiousness to test it. How do I know which test I got? If people are like, oh, I don't know what I got. If you got your results in under an hour, it was a rapid test, trust me. If it took you half of a day or two days or 24 hours, that's not a rapid test. That's what a rapid antigen test is. Again, it requires a high amount of virus to be able to detect it and test positive. The PCR test, which is also known as a molecular test, PCR test is something that does not need a high amount of infectious mucus. It's actually able to detect it even in asymptomatic cases very, very well. But the goal with the PCR test is you need to do it at the right time. So when is the right time? I'm going to give you the scenarios so they all make practical sense for all of you. So let's just say, well, first of all, let me just tell you, PCRs generally should be tested between day four and six after exposure. So somebody tells you they, 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 they tested positive for COVID and you were just with them, count from when you were with them and you wanna test yourself with a PCR four to six days later. But I'm going to adjust this a little bit because of Omicron. So Omicron from the early pieces of data seems like it might be infecting people faster. So it's actually causing symptoms sooner it might also be leaving them faster as a result, right? We might even have a shorter quarantine recommendation with it, we'll see. But the point is it gets to you usually faster and that's the majority of the cases. There's still a lot of delts out there, but the majority now are becoming Omicron in a hurry. So it could be that as soon as day three after exposure, you could already test positive with a PCR, the Omicron. Day three, you might be testing positive, as opposed to usually where they would say, wait till day four. So what I would recommend, I'm gonna give you your most common scenarios. So I have my, my best friend, Seth, on the chat, who's having trouble staying awake in the East Coast. And 
he and he tests positive from COVID and warns me. I was with him yesterday without my mask on. We we're both vaccinated. And I was like, oh, OK. And he's positive. It is a waste of my time the next day to immediately get tested. Why am I getting tested? There is no reason to think that my body is going to already be able to detect it. It's going to be a false negative. It might even be a false positive, honestly. But here is what I do do. I wait until A, three or four days later minimum, but I'm still going to recommend waiting a full four days. Because remember I told you typically it's day four through six when you test after a, when you test with a PCR, maybe now it's as early as day three. Well, you don't know which one you've been exposed to even if you have. So rather than just guess between four, five and six or even three now, just get tested on day four. That would be my recommendation. Four days after exposure is a very, very, very strong likelihood that if you got exposed and you had COVID, you're going to test positive with a PCR, which is about 95% uh, accurate, even with asymptomatic cases. I'm not done, but go ahead, Stu. I'm, there was a possible exposure for me on Saturday. The, uh, the pharmacist said, come in seven days later. Is that okay? This past Saturday, yeah, there was an exposure said, to you? Maybe. We're not sure, but it's possible. Possible exposure. So Saturday, so today is Thursday. So Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. That's five days later. Perfect time to get a PCR. It's Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. No, you don't have to include Saturday. From Saturday till now would be right. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. It's That was five days away. And even if it was six, and even if it was six days away, you would still be in the range of of testing for it. So you seven getting? I'm sorry. Seven too long to wait. Seven days. Seven starts to be a bit long, where it might be past, and you wouldn't know. But if you got tested today and it was Saturday, that is not too long ago to get tested from PCR. That is perfectly fine. In your case, I would have told you get tested yesterday. Today is perfectly fine too but with a PCR test, not a rapid test. Now, here is where I have to adjust my answer. Let's just say that at, after an exposure, you're waiting till day four, right, to get tested with a PCR, but before day four comes, uh-oh, you have terrible symptoms, you start having mucus and so on, fever. Now is when it's perfectly reasonable and appropriate to get a rapid antigen test in addition to your PCR test. Now you don't have to wait because you have the symptoms. So you should have enough virus of whatever it is to be able to test positive in there. So my point is that antigen tests are very, very useful and pretty darn good when you have a good amount of infectious virus there, if you have your symptoms. So you get symptoms, you should get both tests. You don't have symptoms, well, under a normal circumstance, you're not getting tested just because, but somebody tells you had an exposure, like I just said to Stuart, four days later would be a good time to get a PCR test. You want to double, double, double check it, feel free to get another PCR test, maybe two days after that. So that's, that's what I would say in terms of proper adequate testing. Now, am I actually disagreeing a little bit with, I'm, I'm disagreeing slightly, slightly with the recommendations that are just coming out in the last few weeks because the recommendations are starting to say if you're about to go and you're about to see people and you're vaccinated and they're vaccinated you should also do a rapid test and a rapid test and a rapid test and a rapid test i don't really honestly see a huge benefit in a case-by-case -case basis i know in a massive statistical basis that is helpful and i get that it is helpful statistically but on a case-by-case -case basis the truth is if you don't have symptoms and you're going to test yourself with a rapid test it is almost always going to end up being negative so you're kind of wasting a test most of the time yes i get it if you're going to go to an opera and the opera has mandatory rapid testing before you enter i get it out of the thousand people entering the opera there's going to be some that'll test positive and that'll help you've just helped your statistical sample size because a few people had enough infectious vac virus in them that they tested positive and that was helpful but on a case-by-case -case basis when you're about to hang out with somebody and you have no symptoms and they have no symptoms and neither of you have a known exposure do i really see a reason to get tested asymptomatically with a rapid test that will probably be a false negative anyway? Not really. One thing I can give you as an adjusted suggestion is let's say you're about to go visit, you know, your 99 year old grandfather who has no good immunity, right? Somebody who's in that 3%. 
that doesn't have good immunity and you're about to see them, that's maybe somebody where you want to take good measures. I'll tell you some good measures. Maybe about three, four days before you see them, stop seeing other people, mask like crazy, be very careful so that you're not exposed, you can't catch it yourself. The day before you go to see that, per that person, go ahead and get yourself a PCR test and feel free to get a rapid test as well if you would like. That's the type of scenario where I could see for that special person doing a little bit of extra measures for them. But in a typical, I'm vaccinated, I'm boosted, I have a friend who's vaccinated and boosted, neither of us have symptoms, and we're gonna go hang out and have coffee. Do I have any reason particularly where I feel like we need to rapid test ourselves? I honestly don't. I just don't see enough benefit. If they, if they were effective enough on like PCRs on asymptomatic people, I would say yes. But without that, I just don't see much benefit. And what's the hugest downside there? The, the, you're, if you're not part of the 3% and you're vaccinated and boosted and you're gonna meet with somebody else who's vaccinated and boosted and you're gonna hang out, okay, one of you might catch COVID, it could happen. It might even be inevitable at some point when you have enough get togethers. But realistically, you're probably gonna have no symptoms or a common cold at that point. So I just wanted to, point out my recommendations of testing. Um, let me tell you about two exciting things that are coming out. Um, one of them is for the 3% of the population that has no benefit, right? That has, sorry, that has no good immune system. For that 3% of the population, we already know about the idea of the monoclonal antibodies. They've had them for a while, where you're basically giving somebody antibodies, right? Because they don't have antibodies or they don't have enough. So this is a cocktail that's actually being created and it's going to be released very soon, probably, from AstraZeneca. And it's called Evasheld. And I can't say anything enough about it yet because it's not released yet. So they're going to still have to peer review more of it. But it's pretty cool, assuming that all the data is correct, because essentially what they're doing is they're able to specifically for the 3% of the population, which don't have enough immunity from the vaccines because they just don't have strong enough systems, that 3% of the population, it's a direct preventative infusion giving them long-term antibodies. So yeah, we know their body might not be able to create enough antibodies because they're not strong enough, we're giving them the antibodies, basically it's giving them them as a transplant. It's pretty cool. And it's going to be for people 12 and up if they're in that 3% of the population. And it would probably be given once every six months, but it might even be given once a year. So that's pretty cool. And keep that in mind for people you know who have severe immunosuppression that are terrified to go anywhere for medical reasons. That's really good to know. Because the main people that we ever read about who are vaccinated and are still hospitalized, are vaccinated, are still dying, they almost always fall into that 3% of the population. They're the ones that really need the majority of help. Those are the Colin Powell's of the world, right? Then here's something that is being released right now. Yesterday, the FDA authorized uh, Pfizer, who has an, a new antiviral pill. It's called Paxlovid. And what it, it's really cool because what happens is you get infected, right? And the idea of the infection is that it then, the virus, not your antibodies, but the virus, tries to replicate all over the body. And that's how it makes you more sick. It tries to go here, there, everywhere. It wants to become a lowered, lower tract in, in infection. So it becomes pneumonia, right? And enters your heart and so on. The way that Paxlovid works, which looks really cool, is it will inhibit the protein, the enzyme that the virus needs to replicate. It will stop that enzyme. So it'll make it really hard for it to actually replicate and thus do damage. The name of that enzyme is called protease. So the protease enzyme gets gets inhibited and then the virus can't do much damage. The, uh, it's really fantastic and the results on it so far have been fantastic. It's somewhere between 80 and 90% at preventing severe symptoms. And if you, you have to take it in the first one to five days of symptoms, one to five days. The earlier you take it in your symptoms, the better because it'll prevent replication. And I believe it's going to be three pills twice a day for five days, if you care about the practical way it would be. It would be a prescription, doctor would write it, you'd get a prescription like at your pharmacy, and it'll be three pills twice a day for five days. Okay, so that's pretty cool. Merck, Merck has their own antiviral pill that is also pseudo getting, getting released, but I'm not going to sit here and tout that pill because it very narrowly was getting authorized with release. And some of the people that voted to release it literally said, we're only releasing, we're only going to say yes to this pending that there's nothing better because it really had a low efficacy rate and even worse, it actually was causing bad side effects. So 
I'm not even going to sing sing the. I don't even know if that one is more good than harm, but it certainly, to me, seems unnecessary now that we actually have one coming out, which looks amazing, the Pfizer one, um, by Paxlovid. And I promise you, I do not get paid anything by Pfizer. I'm not a pharmaceutical shell shell. Um, I'm going to give you some oh, last. What's the name of that Pfizer? What's Paxlovid. The name of that? Paxlovid, P-A-X-L-O-V-I-D, get literally authorized yesterday. Okay, U.S. COVID deaths, 806,000 so far. It was 2% of all cases that were dying before the vaccines. It's been pretty consistently for a while now down to 1.6%. So about 1.6% of cases have died. But there's going to be people who are going to say, okay, well, how many people have actually died from the vaccine? I mean, that's a common thing I'll hear out there. How many people have been killed because of the mRNA vaccines? Well, all of the vaccines total, Johnson & Johnson and Pfizer and Moderna, I'm going to give you the worst case scenario number because it's reported to the VAERS, V-A-E-R-S, even though this number is actually inflated because they actually look back and they do pathologies and autopsies and they're like, oh, this person who had the vaccine a week ago and died, turns out they were in a car crash on the freeway and the you know, they punctured their lung and that's why they died. It had nothing to do with it. But just like I did with the, with the, with the myocarditis cases, I'm going to give you the worst case scenario, okay? Worst case scenario, how many people have died because of taking the vaccine? Over 10,000, about just under 10 and a half thousand people. Sounds like a lot. It is a lot. And I don't, even though I'm rushing through the end of this, I don't want to make light of it. That's very, very, very sad if you died because of the vaccine. It's freaking horrible and depressing. But what percentage of doses resulted in a death from something, a blood clot, anaphylaxis, any of the things we've talked about so far? The answer is 0.0022%. 0.0022% of doses have murdered people, right? Horrible, awful, tragic. But how many people are dying of COVID from cases? 1.6%. 1.6%. All right. And it was more, and it was more like 2% before the vaccination. But even if we give them the lower number of 1.6%, compared to 0.0022%, I'm just gonna help you with a little bit of math here. It is 7,772 times more likely to die from COVID than from the vaccine. Now, you might hear those numbers and say, oh, but there's multiple doses at a time, so let's cut that number in half. Okay, let's call that close to 4,000 times more, less likely. Oh, you're gonna say, oh, but young people are less likely than old people. All right, let's just say a young, healthy person has only half a percentage point of dying if they get COVID, not 1.6%. Half a percent versus 0.0022%, no matter how you look at it, you are literally thousands of times more protected by COVID, more of a chance, sorry, by, by the vaccine, and more of a chance of dying from COVID than from the vaccine, which hopefully brings all of the things we've talked about together. Last stats, 4,000 a day were dying before, at the peak before the vaccines. It's about 2,000 a day, give or take, on average. Now, and for a while, since Delta, 497 million doses have been given in the U.S. 203 million have, people have been fully vaccinated in the U.S. 61% of the population has been fully vaccinated. The world has only vaccinated 48% so far. We still need the rest of the world to also get vaccinated. If unvaccinated, eight times more common if you're unvaccinated than if you're vaccinated. But there's a range depending on your age, right, and your risk factors. So it is anywhere between six to 12 times more common depending on your age group. So even if you are the age group that is least benefited by the vaccine, you're still six times less likely to be hospitalized if you're vaccinated. And how much more likely are you to be uh, die, to die if you're not vaccinated? 14 times, 14 times more likely to die if you're not vaccinated. And if you have a booster, it gets even better. Now it's 20 times more likely to die if you're not vaccinated than somebody who's had a booster, 20 times more likely. And even though we're getting tons of breakthrough cases, even for vaccinated people and boosted people, let me just tell you, if you are not boosted yet, but you're vaccinated, you're still five times less likely to be 
to, to have a breakthrough case. You're still five times more likely to test positive. And if you get a booster, you're 10 times less likely to get to test positive. So it works across the board. And I'm going to have to stop over there because I know people are arriving for the next session, which is supposed to start two minutes ago. So I'm going to have to apologize to any of you who still have questions, but tell you you can reach out to me privately and you can still ask your questions privately. I'm more than happy to still answer, but I will have to stop now for obvious reasons for the next well, session. Thank you. You're very, thank very you. welcome. Thank you. My pleasure. I hope it was helpful and interesting for everybody. Well, thank you.